I will now hand it over to Vice Chair Gilmore. Thank you. I can't hear a word you're saying, so I'm not sure what's going on with the... Does that always happen that way? Nope. Just make sure you talk right into the... That we all speak directly into the microphone. It should be better that way. Thank you. <laughs> we will open this meeting, and we have one commissioner... We can go ahead and proceed with um, items two and three. All right. I'm sure Commissioner Holt is on his way. Hopefully, yes. <clears throat> um, Chief Examiner, will you please take the roll? Uh, Commissioner Stevens? Thank oh. That's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I was looking for my glasses so I can okay. read this stuff, so. <laughs> Roll call's done. We're all here. Everyone is present except for Mr. Holt. Commissioner Gilmore present. Commissioner Palmerton present. Commissioner Stevens present. Uh, could we uh, have approval of the minutes of the November 15th meeting? Yes, I move to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And the chief examiner update. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Happy New Year to everyone as well. I have just a few brief things to review with you guys. Um, one, excitedly, we have, the city has hired a new HR director. They were hired and confirmed at last week's city council meeting, so we'll be joining um, this organization sometime mid-February. So as soon as I can, I will get them on an agenda and bring them to a commission meeting and, so that you can all meet um, the new director. Oh, that's fantastic. Yep. And that means we get our legal counsel back too, right? Full time. Full time. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. All right. Well, congrats. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, other things coming up, uh, rule review is starting back up this week. And just as a reminder, we have completed five full rules. We're currently working on a sixth, and we have six more rules remaining. I'm hoping we will be done by late spring and have something to present to all of you. That may be a little ambitious, but I think we might get there. We've done a lot of good work. Um, and then also, we have, staff and I have begun working on the annual report, and we'll have a report to present to you all in March this year. Okay. And then finally, just uh, it's shaping up to be another very busy year for us. I don't expect any slowdown. If anything, I expect it to be busier than last year. Yay. <laughs> and that concludes my update. Thank you. Do you happen to know, um, uh, I believe you and I spoke briefly about this. You did a labor one test in November, correct? We did. Are we moving through those lists then pretty good? Or? I think we've just started using that labor okay. one list, but I expect we will be testing again this year for labor one. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Uh, okay, we move on to item four, uh, new business uh, resolution 2023-01. All right. Uh, we present two new job classifications for adoption this month. The first, SPN 342, Resource Conservation Manager. This is a newly established body of work for city, city facilities in the field of energy efficiency and conservation. The department and MMP association concur with this job classification as written. The second is SPN 592, Waste to Energy Electrical and Instrumentation Supervisor. This is also a new level of work in the waste to energy plant, electrical and instrumentation section, performing a working supervisor role. The department and Local 270 concurred with this job classification as written. We recommend the adoption of both of these classifications. I move to approve them both. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm assuming there are no opposed since there's no one else here right now. So uh, that um, that resolution passes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is uh, item B, appeal of Corporal Conrath, a Passover for cause. 
Um, until after 10 o'clock. It yes. is. I have to take about a five minute break, or I need, I will need to take about a five minute break at 10 o'clock. I just want to inform everybody of that. It'll, it's, it's just an issue. I have to run back here for a few minutes and be right back. But it's, uh, we can either go ahead and start now. We can't start. Oh, can go back there right now. We can't start without Greg. There's not, nobody here? No. And Mr. Coleman, uh, Mr. the appellant's attorney is running late, and Craig is running late. So we're going to need to adjourn. Only um, until 10, we've until we've got some people that have been a little delayed that are, uh, um, you know, hugely involved in this next item. So we're going to take a break now for about five, ten minutes, and until that 10, should get everybody 10. here, right? Wait until 10.05. 10, until 10.05? Yes. Okay, I've just been informed. We're going to take a break until 10.05. So um, we will resume at 10.05. Thank you.
<clears throat> I'm going to call the meeting back to order. Okay. We are currently awaiting the appellant's attorney who got stuck in court this morning, so. Uh, thank you for your patience, everyone. Commissioners included, thank you. Well, my apologies to the commission for being late. And welcome, Commissioner Holt. <laughs> I think we have to, I think we have to um, take another recess. Uh, we do. Uh, we can, Pending, it's gonna be a while. I think we maybe, if you tell for a recess till 1030, that way they can, recess. they can be in recess and not um, live. So my if we're driving at twenty twelve or if she was gonna start calling. Until we have a committed start time uh, for all the parties present, I'm going to um, allow the commission to uh, recess for a few more minutes. I'm sorry to keep doing this, but this is an important matter and I wanna make sure that everyone's here that needs to be, if we can possibly make that happen. So we will recess until, it's 10.14, I'm gonna say 10.30, at that time a decision is gonna to have to be made, I believe. So thank you, we are adjourned.
is now 10.32. I'm going to reconvene the Civil Service Commission. Appreciate everyone's patience. Um, <clears throat> and with that, I would ask our chief examiner to um, to introduce and uh, to um, move forward in the procedures that must take place today as this is a legal proceedings. Kelsey. Thank you, Commissioner Gilmore. Uh, item 4B is the Christopher Conrath appeal hearing. A little background, Mr. Conrath, uh, police corporal for the city of Spokane Police Department, was passed over for cause for the position of police sergeant under Civil Service Rule 5, Section 4A. Under Civil Service Rule 4, Section 4A, no promotion certification shall be rejected except for reasonable cause, and no promotional eligible shall be passed over except for reasonable cause. Reasonable cause for passing over a promotional eligible may include the following. One, an eligible's documented substandard work performance, or two, an eligible's documented prior disciplinary problems, or three, documented errors on an eligible's judgment, or four, any other documented performance-related reasons, or five, a mutual Passover. Mr. Conrath was notified by the Chief Examiner according to Civil Service Rule 5, Section 4C, on August 22nd, 2022, of the Passover for cause for a vacant police sergeant position. He replied timely that he would wish to appeal the decision. Mr. Conrath was notified again on November 4th, 2022, that he had been passed over for a vacant police sergeant position and replied timely that he wished to appeal the additional Passover for cause. Mr. Conrath is being represented by Mr. Joel Kuhlman with no briefing submitted, and the city of Spokane is being represented by Mr. Mike Bolasina with briefing and exhibits attached. The city may go first. I, I want to remind you before you start speaking to speak really into the mic so that everyone can hear you and we can hear you up here. Thank you. That, that has never been an issue with me. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and I, I would like to start with an opening statement. Please proceed, Mr. Right. Bolasina. Uh, good morning. Um, you may feel like this is deja vu from about a year and a half ago. Uh, there have been a few changes. Uh, the conduct at issue has changed. And the cast of characters has changed somewhat, but we're, we're back uh, presenting a case as to why Corporal Conrath uh, should or should not have been passed over for the position of sergeant. Uh, my client representative is the assistant chief, Justin Lundgren, who is sitting next to me. Uh, he is the second in command at the police department. Uh, he made the decision to impose the discipline that later resulted in Cal Corporal Conrath being passed over for promotion to sergeant. Uh, he will testify as to the reasons for initiating that investigation, imposing discipline, and why he was in favor of the Passovers that are being appealed. Uh, Major Olson, er Eric Olson, will be our second witness. Uh, he is also part of Chief Meidel's executive team. He was involved in the decision to investigate and the decision to discipline, and he will testify about why he made the decision to pass over Corporal Conrath for his conduct. Uh, our first witness will be Captain Tracy Meidel, who is here today. Uh, the primary reason we are here today is Corporal Conrath sent to all commissioned officers an insolent and disrespectful email whose, contact, whose content was directed at Captain Meidel. Uh, Captain Meidel will testify as the circumstances that gave rise to that email and why she believes Cap Corporal Conrath was attempting to embarrass and undermine her authority with his response. Uh, Corporal Conrath, I'm sorry, um, Captain Meidel was involved in the last hearing as well. Uh, in that last hearing, she testified because she was the author of the ARP pod, and she testified as to why ARP recommended policy violations uh, be sustained on the prior disciplinary matter. Uh, I'm not calling the investigators, uh, Sergeant Uberagua or Lieutenant Col Coles, or members of the ARP. Uh, you have the emails in the exhibit books at issue. 
Um, the investigator's interview of Corporal Conrath is transcribed, and it is an exhibit at Exhibit 7. Uh, mm -hmm. So is the investigator's summary report and the report of the ARC pod. Uh, so to use a legal phrase, I'm just going to let those documents speak for themselves. Uh, the question presented here is, did Major Eric Olson have cause to pass over Corporal Conrath for promotion to sergeant on August 22nd? 2022 and November 4th, 2022. Uh, Corporal Conrad's position per his appeal is no cause. Uh, I don't know anything more at this stage about Corporal Conrad's position at the hearing. Uh, I do know that his position during the investigation, and that was uh, the email I sent to all commissioned officers was a sincere apology to the entire department and I don't know how it could be taken any other way. Uh, it was not taken that way. It was not considered a sincere apology uh, by the command staff, uh, the executive team members, the investigators, the ARPOB members, uh, and the witnesses who will testify. Um, uh, Corporal Conrad's position during the investigation, you know, how would anyone be suspicious of my sincere for heartfelt apology was in fact not accepted as an excuse, but considered in furtherance of the insolence that he was displaying that day. Uh, the city's position is, yes, there was cause. Um, and we start with, you know, what is the city looking for in filling sergeant's positions? Uh, sergeants are the direct supervisors of the officers on patrol. They are looked at and on by patrol officers for guidance and leadership. And they need to be able to provide it on a daily basis throughout the shift and as events are unfolding. Uh, they also serve as role models, both in their daily duties and in their relationships with command staff. Uh, when the police department is filling a sergeant's position, they are looking for candidates who can be trusted to exercise good judgment. And the civil service rules address the issues of Passover. They expressly authorize passing over a candidate for, for promotion if there is documented discipline, and the rules specifically call out documented errors in an applicant's judgment as a valid reason for Passover. Now, taking us back to July 2021, the Civil Service Commission ruled in favor of the city when Corporal Conrath appealed his Passover following discipline he received after initiating romantic relationships with women he met while responding to DV calls. That, those, that, that, that conduct was viewed as a serious lapse of judgment, uh, where Co Corporal Conrath was putting his own needs and interests first and not seeing the consequences of his actions on either the women, the department, or law enforcement generally. Uh, as I said then, during that hearing, Corporal Conrath was still seen as being potential sergeant material. Uh, technically speaking, he's a very competent officer. Uh, but before he could be promoted to the position, Chief Meidel believed he had to demonstrate that he was capable of keeping his nose clean and capable of exercising good, mature judgment for a period of time before he would be a viable candidate for that sergeant's position. Now, the conduct at issue here occurred two months after the commission issued its verbal decision on that prior appeal and one month after the commission issued its formal decision. So it's very close in time. It decided before July of 2021. The email we're here today on was September of 2021. And what that demonstrated to the executive team was that Corporal Conrath had not taken either Chief Meidel's testimony or the commission's decision to heart and had not made the changes necessary to make him a viable candidate for a sergeant's position. Uh, he, was he was annoyed about being called out for a mistake and reacted by, take, by, by taking an insolent swipe at his commanding officer. And he did it in full view of 400 other officers and volunteers. Although the conduct in the 2021 and 2022 Passovers looks different, uh, the assistant chief Lundgren and Major Olson saw similarities, and that was lack of maturity, lack of discretion, 
uh, acting on what seemed desirable for him in the moment without being concerned about the impact on others or the department. And what this showed them was that Corporal Conrath was doubling down on demonstrating that he lacked good judgment rather than showing that he was capable of growth and change. And for those reasons, the city passed over Corporal Conrath for the positions of sergeant when he was up next, and we're gonna ask you to affirm that decision at the conclusion of this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bolasina. You may call your first witness. I will need to give them an oath, if you're ready. Good morning, Captain Meidel. Good morning. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in the matter now being heard will be the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Your name for the record? Tracy Meidel. And are you any relation to the Spokane Police Chief? Yes, we are married. Okay. Uh, can you tell the commissioners what your current position is at the Spokane Police Department? I currently, as of January 8th, now oversee the investigative division. And your prior position? I oversaw the patrol division for the two years prior. Right. And what, what period of time were you overseeing the patrol division? 2021 and 2022. How long have you been a captain? Uh, for almost six years now. And how long have you been with the Spokane Police Department? Uh, for 29 years commissioned, and then I was a volunteer before that. All right. Now, can you give uh, the commissioners just a brief description of your duties when you were the captain overseeing patrol? I oversaw about 125 officers and uh, their chain of command. And uh, with that was policies and procedures, uh, administration, uh, training, budgets, equipment, and uh, some specialty units, as well as reviewing uses of force, collision reviews, um, complaints and pursuits. Uh, let's turn our attention now to Corporal Conrath. Uh, do you know Corporal Conrath? Yes, I do. I've known him since he was a reserve for our, our department. And uh, describes or sort of like what kind of interaction you had with him when you were the captain overseeing patrol. Uh, the interaction was uh, essentially at roll calls, uh, different trainings, uh, incidental contact. Uh, were you involved in any other performance or disciplinary matters regarding Corporal Conrath? Yes, I was the author of an administrative review panel decision uh, regarding Corporal Conrath. And, and just briefly, what was the conduct you were looking into regarding Corporal Conrath on, their prior, on that prior art pod? There were four different allegations. Uh, one was uh, developing a relationship with someone he met on duty, uh, conduct unbecoming, uh, sexual relations on duty, and dishonesty. And in preparing the report for ARP, uh, did the ARP pod recommend any sustained findings on any violations? Uh, there was sustained findings on two allegations, and that was the developing a relationship while on duty and the conduct unbecoming. Uh, after preparing that ARP report, did you have any other involvement in that disciplinary matter? No. All right. And any involvement in the dis decision to pass him over for promotion in 2021 after that disciplinary matter? No. All right. Did you testify at the previous Civil Service Commission appeal hearing regarding the Passover? Yes, I did. All right. And what, what did you testify about? I testified uh, of the ARP uh, administrative review panel process, uh, what that entailed, and the fact that I authored 
the group decision with no dissenting opinions. Mm. Uh, how would you describe your relationship with Corporal Conrad since your involvement in that prior disciplinary matter? Uh, essentially, when I go to roll calls, there's no eye contact. When other people are making eye contact with me, he does not. Uh, basically, the cold shoulder type of feeling. So let's turn our attention now to September 28, 2021. Uh, and I'm going to start now re referring to some exhibits. And uh, Ms. Pearson, does the, do the Civil Service Commissioners have all the exhibits in front of them? Uh, so first, some background. Uh, are, are you familiar with how the city maintains coverage for vehicle collision claims against it? Yes. And briefly describe that. Uh, so when... There are collisions, accidents, essentially involving city of Spokane vehicles. The city is self-insured for up to one and a half million dollars. Anything over that, the city um, gets excess insurance coverage. Now, has there been any confusion or miscommunications in patrol due to that layer of self-insurance coverage? There has been confusion in the past, uh, essentially, when officers respond to collisions, whether it's a police department vehicle or other city entity vehicles, um, we've carried an insurance card in our vehicles with that excess insurance provider's information on it. So when officers have responded in the past, instead of putting self-insured, occasionally there have been times when they put that excess insurance provider name and information on the collision report. Um, and what, what, when, that, when that error happens, uh, what, is, what has been the typical response? Uh, typically, and I, I have sent out uh, basically all police commissioned emails before just as a reminder of including a self-insured uh, written piece under the insurance so that there's no confusion. Uh, but there has been occasional mistakes that occur, and typically I would just address those in an email directed to the person that completed the collision report, the person that reviewed and uh, submitted and approved the report, as well as that chain of command. So as, as the captain overseeing patrol, I don't basically communicate with somebody uh, in a different, in my chain of command without including the, uh, the sergeant, for example, the lieutenant, so that they're aware of my communication to their employee. Mm -hmm. So if you could turn to exhibit number one in the exhibit book. So can you tell the, the commissioners what, what happened on September 28, 2021? Uh, I received an email from our city's claims adjuster uh, with an attached collision police report on it that had that error, where <laughs> instead of putting self-insured, the officer put the excess insurance provider. Yeah. And what, what, what was Mr. Scott expressing to you with respect to that email? He was expressing um, a great level of frustration because we'd been dealing with the, these um, errors routinely, and he basically was frustrated that the errors were still being made as well as they were still being approved by the reviewer and submitted instead of sending, being sent back for correction. Now, if you could turn to the third, or I'm sorry, the second page in exhibit number one. And can you explain to the commissioners uh, what this is? So this is an example of what's called a sector collision report. And basically what that is, is a sector is a program that our officers use when writing a collision report. And uh, what you see here is the attachment that Mr. Scott put onto the email that he sent to me. Mm 
right. And can you can you uh, point out to the commissioners where where the s s mistake that Mr. Scott pointed out appears on the form? So about halfway down on this collision report, um, you'll see the registered owner information is the city of Spokane, so it's a city-owned vehicle. And then just below that, the insurance company is listed as Safety National Casualty Corporation, which is the excess insurance provider. All right. And what should that say? It should just say self-insured. And, and who was the, the uh, police officer who made the mistake to identify the excess insurance carrier in here? It was Officer John Yen. Uh, and and are, these, are these forms approved before they were, they're submitted? Yes. And, and who was the officer who approved the report with a mistake on it? Uh, the, and you'll see on the second page of that at the bottom where it has JN as the author of the report, and then it's approved by uh, Corporal Conrath. Okay. Now, could you turn your attention to uh, exhibit number two? Okay. Can you explain to the commissioners what, what the emails are the, in exhibit number two? Uh, exhibit number two is the uh, exchange of email between the claims adjuster, Jim Scott, and myself. And what, can you briefly just describe what you're, what you're discussing in these, in the, these email exchanges? Um, basically, um, I sent him the response I received from the responding officer talking about why he made the error. And um, Mr. Scott then responds to that with uh, the reason the self-insured is so important and then the confusion that it creates. And so I basically responded, it makes complete sense and I'm hopeful that the, the errors will not continue. Mm -hmm. So if you now turn your attention to exhibit three and then on the, on the bottom of the page, if you look to exhibit number uh, three dash two. So can you tell the commissioners what actions you took after having those email exchanges with the claims adjuster, Mr. Scott? So I sent an email to uh, John Yen, Officer John Yen, and to Corporal Chris Conrath, and included their chain of command, and just basically said, just as a reminder, we need to make sure any city-owned vehicle has self-insured on the collision report instead of the excess insurance provider. And why did you email Corporal Conrath as well? Because he is the one that approved the reports and has the potential to approve other reports. Okay. Now, if you turn back to page Exhibit 3-1, and if you look at that, if you look at that bottom email on page 3-1, d uh, did Officer Yen respond to your email? Yes, he did. And, and how, how did he respond to your email? He responded with an apology. Um, he included me and uh, basically the same people that were on that um, email with Corporal Conrath and his chain of command. He okay. apologized essentially and stated why he made the error. And did, what, why did he, how, how did that error come about? So when he responded to the <coughs> collision, it was a sewer department vehicle. And while he states in his email that he recognizes the city is self-insured, when that sewer supervisor responded, they provided him an insurance card with the excess insurance provider on it. So that's why he was a little confused and wrote the excess insurance provider on the collision report. Okay. Did Corporal Conrath respond to the email that you sent to him and to Officer Yen? Uh, no. All right. Now, if you could turn your attention to exhibit number four. And we'll look, look, look at first at the bottom email. Uh, who did you send that email to? I sent that email to all police that are commissioned. Um, 
it's, it's an all commissioned police email group, doesn't necessarily include only commissioned officers. Uh, who, who else does it include? <laughs> Uh, it includes just under 400 people. It includes uh, all of the commission personnel. It includes some of our volunteers. It includes some civilian staff as well. Right. What was your motivation in sending the email that is in the bottom of Exhibit 4? Just, it was another reminder because any officer that can respond to a collision has the potential to make the error. Um, it's also in response to uh, the claims adjuster's email because he obviously was very frustrated and asked me to help with getting this corrected so that there were no errors in the future. He was extremely frustrated in his email. Hmm. And do, in, in your email, do you, do you uh, propose anything to prevent this error from occurring in the future? Yes. Um, so because of uh, Officer Yen's response about the insurance card, um, and our police vehicles have had that insurance card in there. My question to Mr. Scott was, do we need that insurance card in there because it just creates confusion? He said, no, we don't. So my email was also to s state to everybody, they can remove the insurance card from their vehicle because the city is self-insured and it was creating um, a confusion, which then created the errors. Uh, did Officer Yen's collision report, as approved by Corporal Conrath, lead you to send the email in Exhibit 4? Yes. Mm -hmm. And did, did you identify Officer Yen or Corporal Conrath as, and their errors as the reason for why you were sending the email? No, I didn't identify anybody, and there have been multiple officers and corporals making the, the same errors. All right. Now, turn your attention to the top email on Exhibit 4. All right. Uh, did you receive this email? I did receive the email along with the rest of the just under 400 people. Okay. And how did you react when you saw the email that is at the top of Exhibit 4? I was upset. Um, very frustrated because I was trying to correct errors. I am uh, simply doing my job and uh, passing along information. And um, it was very frustrating to me that this email was um, sent to everybody on that list when he was... Um, essentially taking no responsibility and minimizing the, the credibility of the whole chain of command and the authority of making corrections. Right. When you received this email, did you interpret it as a sincere apology from Corporal Conrad? Definitely not. It was, um, it was disrespectful. It was um, derogatory. It was um, undermining and inappropriate. All right. Uh, and why did you why did you conclude that? Uh, if if it was a true apology, uh, like Officer Yen's was, it would have been sent to me, uh, especially because I did not th throw him uh, or his name out as anybody that was part of this error and. Um, it, it did not, um, it, it was just not an apology, and I, I believe anybody that read it, um, several people that had read it um, later had shown that, uh, it had basically come to me and had stated that that was not an apology. Uh, you testify that you view this as, as undermining your authority as the patrol captain, and, and why, why did you view his email as undermining your authority? So as the patrol captain, I send multiple all-police commis commissioned emails, uh, whether it's policies and procedures, which this is a procedural issue to make corrections to and to make sure that uh, all officers are aware of errors and the 
basically the route to not make these errors in the future. Uh, what did you do after receiving the email sent by uh, Corporal Conrath to all commissioned police officers? Um, essentially nothing. I, in the, probably in about a half hour or so after the email, I went down to the major's office, which was my direct supervisor, uh, Major Olson, and um, he commented that he read the email that he had already spoken with the assistant chief about the email and how completely inappropriate it was. And what was your involvement in the process after that, that communication? Uh, they asked me to go with them down to internal affairs, uh, to that office, and uh, so I walked down there with them. And what happened when you were in internal affairs? Well, as soon as we walked in the doorway, uh, Sergeant Ubaraga said, is this about the email? So it was apparent, even to our internal affairs sergeant, that it was an inappropriate email. And what happened while you were in internal affairs? Uh, there was just a discussion um, with the director and uh, they decided to initiate an internal affairs complaint. Okay, and who is the director you're referring to? Uh, director McConnell. All right, and what was your involvement after that visit to internal affairs in this, in this process? Nothing, I had no involvement after that. Uh, that's all the questions I have for right now. Mr. Coleman, did you have any questions for Captain Meidel? So I just want to start off. So let me grab the book. If we can go back time, I guess, because we can go back in time a little bit. Mr. Coleman, you'll need to speak into the microphone. Oh, I get in trouble for this in court too. I'm a wanderer. Like this. Yes. That would be helpful, Thank counselor, you. so we can all hear you. So I agree with counsel. We were here before. Um, so the discipline that Corporal Conrath faced, what, what actual discipline did he face for those past allegations that were against him? I actually don't know. Um, those were civil in nature, weren't they? Civil allegations? Yeah. I think they were, well, they were policy violations. They were internal policy violations. And we can agree that there's no criminal nature to them? Correct. And SPD has a policy mm -hmm. where if it's past a year on a non-criminal allegation, um, someone can't be disciplined, correct? Correct. And these allegations that previously brought us here were past a year old. The, are you talking about the previous? You're talking about the previous article. Previous time. Previous time. It was over. Yeah, they were over a year old. So... What counsel was talking about, about the past allegations against Mr. Uh, Corporal Conrath were actually outside SPD's own policy, um, but he was still disciplined for those? I, I'm not sure about the discipline part of it. I wasn't part of the discipline. So what we do know is if they were past a year old and weren't criminal in nature, that he couldn't be disciplined for them due to SPD's own policy. Correct. I'm not hearing the attorney's questions. I'm sorry, ma'am. I'll get right up on it. Thank you. Um, so basically, just to reiterate that there, due to SPD's own policy, there couldn't be discipline against Corporal Conrad for non-criminal allegations as they were because they're a past year old. Correct. Okay. So... How many emails were sent to Corporal Conrath regarding this issue of the checkbox by superiors, administration, um, kind of essentially everyone that was above him? That I don't know. I just know I sent 
two emails that he would have received. One was directly to him, and then the all police commissioned email. Okay. Now, in the opening statements, um, you were present when council was speaking about how a sergeant is a leader. Correct. All right. So, with that, um, a sergeant is someone who <coughs> takes responsibility deals with his mistakes and corrects what's been done wrong. Is that accurate to say? Sure, yes. And were you aware that at this time Corporal Conrath was working uh, as the owner of Corporal sometimes between four different, I believe, what did we call them? Teams, four patrol teams. I was not aware. And at this time, your role was uh, the captain of patrol? Yes. Okay. Um, and in fact, Corporal Conrath has been used quite frequently in his career to work out of grade as a de facto sergeant. Is that correct? Yes. So it's, he can work out of grade as a de facto sergeant, he just can't, he's just not ready to be promoted to get the full three stripes. Is that correct? That was not my decision. Okay. But as you understand it, that is the decision? That, is, that was the decision, yes. All right. So the email that was sent to all police commission by Corporal Conrath was in response to an email that was originally sent to all police commission. Correct. Okay. Now, how much of a problem has this been? Because I notice it says all. Once again, I'm sending out a reminder, this box issue. How prevalent has this been uh, within SPD? Uh, I would say occasionally, maybe once every other month. It, it, it's kind of sporadic how often the errors were occurring. Um, some I would get, you know, two or three a week, and then it would be a month or two before I re re would receive any other errors. Um, so it was kind of sporadic. And how long had it been going on for? Uh, well, the entire time I was the patrol captain. Uh, so I guess temporally, uh, years, months. Do you know how long this issue had been going on within the department? Uh, it would just be an assumption that it was occurring before I became the patrol captain. And how many reminders have you sent out on this issue or, or attempts to correct it, I guess, via email? Uh, multiple. I, I would have to go back and look at uh, sent emails, but many. Right. And in the email to all police commissioned, your original email on the, I think it's 3 4 for the city. Um, it makes no mention of Corporal Conrad's involvement. Is that correct? That's correct. But then he replies to all, uh, identify himself as the person who made the mistake. Correct. And uh, did he send this email uh, to anyone personally? Administration was this email sent by Corporal Conrath uh, a different time to anyone in particular, any individual, or was it just this email to all police commission? Uh, that's the only one I received. I don't know if he sent it to anybody else. All right. And then. When the investigation happened, were you part of that investigation at all? No. Um, and then who ultimately makes the decision to pass over Corporal Conrath for this sergeant position? Uh, I believe it was Major Olson. Okay. And is it just Major Olson by himself? I don't know. Right. And, and has it been Major Olson previously who's made that decision? I don't know.
So I'm seeing this right. We're here, and the, soul, the issue is a report that Officer Yen wrote. They didn't have the box checked. It was approved by Corporal Conrath. And there was error that the box wasn't checked. And then we have the apology email. Um, it wasn't a checked box issue. It was um, actually written out. It was supposed to say self-insured, and it had the insurance provider on there. Understood. So Officer Yen didn't write self-insured. Corporal Conrath didn't catch it. Emails went out. And then the apology email by Corporal Conrath went out to everyone, identified himself, and that was viewed as insubordination. Correct. Thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you again. Apologize for being late. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Any questions or clarifying questions I or do. Cap issues? Captain Meidel, a question. Thank Sorry, you. Yes. <clears throat> so I'm just going to paraphrase here a little bit. Uh, you indicated during your testimony um, that this email that went out to all 400 commissioned uh, individuals um, demonstrated, paraphrasing, a disrespect for the chain of command. So question here, and I'm sitting here using our rules Yes. in conjunction with this. So I'll read the rule that I'm focusing on here. Uh, documented errors in an ineligible's judgment, um, other documented performance related reasons. So I'm sitting here and if I come in cold off the street, which I did, and my apologies to you all because I was running late, but I wasn't the latest one in the room, so <laughs> thank you. Um, if I come in cold off the street and I say, it's an email. It's one email. It's the only email. I, I've never heard Corporal Conrath's name before. I, I don't think he's ever pulled me over. He hasn't. Um, so I, I read an email, and I'm like, it's one email. But, and then you went down to Internal Affairs, and the person in Internal Affairs said, oh, this must be about that email. So that leads me to believe that there must be Wondering if, I don't want to say leads me to believe, I'm wondering if there are other demonstrated instances of disrespecting the chain of command that someone who just reads one email wouldn't get. I mean, I'm, I'm a supervisor. I get lots of emails. I have employees. I know what their intentions are when they send an email. Corporal Conrath's not one of my employees. I don't know him. So are there other instances where would lead the person in internal affairs to go, oh, it must be about that email. Are there other things, are there other demonstrated issues or errors in judgment that have been present prior to this that would have led to this type of hassle? Uh, and just to be clear, are you referencing Corporal Conrath in general or the agency in general? Cor Corporal Conrath in general. Um, I, I don't know if there have been previous emails sent by him that okay. would have led them to believe that. Um, it was just this specific email while claiming to be the apology was um, just sarcastic, minimizing my attempt to correct okay. errors and minimizing and rationalizing his behavior. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for answering my question. I just have a couple quick questions too, Captain Meidel. Yes. Mine's <clears throat> kind of a chain of command question. And so, uh, no doubt, um, when you look at this, some correct action needed to be taken. And so, would you normally send an email directly to a line officer and a corporal, um, directly from the command staff captain, or would that normally go to the lieutenant, to the sergeant, to address with their immediate subordinates? Um, what I found typically is if it's um, a timely correction that needs to be made, I will connect with the officer um, as soon as possible through email, which is why I include a chain of command so that they know I'm kind of reaching below them, but that they're all aware of it. Do you think that getting a, an email from the captain carries more weight than getting one from a sergeant? Yes, I do. And was that your intent, was to try to drive the point home? 
Yes, and yes, correct the errors for sure. And then I just have one other question. And in looking at your email, you had, well, and, and listening to your earlier testimony, you had said that the insurance carrier agent was really frustrated because this was a continuing problem. And you've addressed it. And, and so when I look at your email and you started off with, oh, once again, I'm sending out, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, were you frustrated with uh, the lack of compliance with corrective action? Yes, I was frustrated as well. You think the officers might have picked up on that? Uh, possibly, yeah. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I have a couple questions for you as well, Captain. <clears throat> the first email that you sent out was specific to a few people, correct? Correct. And the only email that you sent out broadly to the all commissioned officers was just the one? Correct. Okay. And in your subject line, if we look at the exhibits, what is the subject line of the all commissioned email? Uh, my, subject, my subject line says city involved collisions slash insurance cards. And that's the singular email that went out to all commissioned officers, correct? Correct. And the single response was by Corporal Conrath, correct? Correct. And what was the subject line of the single email by Corporal Conrath? It was changed to, I'm sorry, period. So if we look at these two exhibits, would it be fair to conclude that he changed the subject line? In other words, he had to affirmatively delete your subject line and put in his subject line, correct? That is correct. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I have one more. Thank you. Um, <laughs> just to, to clarify, so when you sent that out, you sent that to all commissioned? Yes. And so, for example, um, when Officer Yen replied to you, he replied individually, Officer Yen to Captain Meidel. Yes. Um, I know you're not an IT person, but in order to send the email that my fellow commissioner just described, you would have to choose to hit reply all versus just reply, and you would also have to change, physically change the subject line. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Meidel. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Coleman? Come on up to the microphone. You raised a question with me, sir. Uh, the email that Officer Yen replied to was the direct email that you sent. To that Yen. is correct. And there's, so essentially there's, there's two emails uh, in question here, the all commission officers and then the one Officer Yen um, that was just spoken about. Correct. Thank you. I, I don't have anything further. I didn't mean to turn my back on the commission. Thank you, Thank you Captain Thank you. Minor. Thank you. Mr. Molasina, if you want to call your next witness. Yes. Uh, the city would like to call uh, Major Eric Holder. Uh, uh, Chief Counsel, I have a question, and I'm not sure to whom to address it. And I, I think I... I this was 155 pages, so I may have forgotten, and I may not be turning to the one where I highlighted it. But um, I, w I just want to double check. Corporal Conrath has been in the police department for 16 years, I believe. Is that correct, or am I wrong on that figure? Approximately. Uh. Yes. Chief Examiner uh, is oh. indicating yes. Yes, okay, sorry. And then my second part of that question, part B is, so during those 16 years, uh, I am assuming that Corporal Conrath has used email multiple times. I mean, he does it in his job. I don't know if he did it when he was first hired, but he certainly has in the last few years. Is that correct? Would you say that's correct? Somebody? Um, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Please proceed, Mr. Bolasina. Okay, uh, Major Olson, if you could come up to the podium here. Good morning, Major Olson. Good morning, Ms. Pearson. Good morning, 
Commissioner. I'd like to get you sworn in this morning real quick before you get started. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in the matter now being heard will be the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay. Can you please state your name for the record? Eric Olson, O-L-S-E-N. And your current position in the Spokane Police Department? I'm a police major. And how long have you been a major? About six and a half years. And how long with the Spokane Police Department overall? Almost around 33 years. Right. Uh, what, position, what position did you start in? I was a patrol officer when I first began. Okay, what year? In 1990. And could you please just briefly tell the commissioner sort of your, your history with the Spokane Police Department? Uh, as patrol officer, I served as an academy instructor. I was an FTO. I started on a TAC team. I became a canine handler. I was promoted to detective. I was promoted to sergeant. As sergeant, I worked in a couple units to include the traffic unit. I was promoted to lieutenant, where I served as the bomb squad commander. I was then promoted to captain. and then promoted to major. And a brief description of your general job duties as a major in the Spokane Police Department? In my current position, I've actually held, there's two major positions within the Spokane Police Department. I've held both. I was the investigative and administrative major initially. I'm now the patrol and precincts, which is now just a precinct major. And I oversee basically all the officers, all the chains of command from captain down uh, for all that patrolmen and precincts in town. Uh, who do you report to? Uh, Assistant Chief Lundgren. And going back to September 28, 2021, what was, what was your assignment as a major then? Patrol and precincts. I was basically supervising the same group as now. Okay. And, and who reported to you in that position at the time? My direct reports at that time included the four precinct captains. Okay. And did that include Captain Meidel? Yes, it did. Okay. Now, let's turn our attention to Corporal Conrath. Uh, do you know him? Yes, I do. And how do you know him? I've seen him at you know, roll calls, various trainings. Uh, I took a rifle class that he was the instructor for. Mm -hmm. and, and had you been involved in any prior uh, disciplinary matters or performance issues with Corporal Conrath before this, uh, this email issue? Yes, I was involved in discussions, reference a prior disciplinary matter with some inappropriate relationships of a domestic violence victim. Right. Now, if you could turn your attention to Exhibit 4 in the notebook. Actually, I left my book in my hand. The top email on Exhibit 4, uh, when, did, when did you first learn of this email? I first learned of it when I received it on Tuesday the 28th. And uh, what was your, and when you say you received it, uh, were you, are, are you one of uh, all police commissioned? Yes, when I received it in my inbox, in my email, and I read it, that's, that's when I first became aware of it. Okay, and, and tell the commissioners about your, your initial reaction to Corporal Conrad's email. Um, I found, after reading it, uh, I found it shocking. I, I found it snarky, uh, insolent, disrespectful, and undermining the authority of not only Captain Meidel, but basically uh, Corporal Conrad's chain of command. All right. And can you, can you tell the commissioners uh, what about uh, the email uh, caused you to have that reaction to it? It starts off with it being an apology when he says, first off, I, I owe you an apology. Um, he, Corporal Conrad states he failed to recognize the self-insured, was not noted on a collision report, and went down. And then this is where I believe the sarcasm and disrespect begins when he says, I can only imagine the difficulty of this error has caused some of you to include risk management personnel. Uh, fortunately, though, I received six emails today to remind me of my repeated failures to supervise. Rest assured, I'm now sufficiently motivated to come in to work tonight and do a better job for you. So in that first paragraph, it, it, I mean, to me, there was no sincere apology. It was an attack on the fact that the email was sent, that the fact 
that the email is trying to correct the behavior and it's just disrespectful. And I use the word insolent. Uh, I can use the word snarky. There's lots of words you can use for it. Um, and then, as it continues, sometimes it misses a 15-hour shift while working as the only corporal between four patrol teams to include power shift and graveyard. There lies the possibility that a clerical error may occur. I take full responsibility of this mistake, and again, I'm very sorry. Um, well, if that and that part was by itself, there, there's probably some sincerity in it, but it's precluded by so much that it just really says, I'm so busy that why are you troubling me with this? Going back to that, that first paragraph, it says, uh, uh, fortunately though, I received six emails today to remind me of my repeated failures to supervise. Uh, did, you, did you take it to, to, to mean that, that Corporal Conrad really did feel he was fortunate to have received all those emails? No, that, that's why I said it. In my mind, the email just dripped with sarcasm, um, disrespect, and I, I, I come back to the same words because they, they kind of mean the same thing to me of insolence. Edward mm -hmm. says, uh, I am suffi now sufficiently motivated to come into work tonight and do a better job for you. Did you, did you feel that he was being, that, that, that he really did truly feel more motivated to come in and do a better job? No, I, I don't, don't believe that. I could perceive that in any way. I don't believe any of the readers that would read this would perceive it in that way as well. Right. What did you think that he was, truly, he was in, in, truly communicating in the first paragraph of his email to all commissioned officers? That it was silly for him to be addressed and for this matter to be corrected that um, I, and again, I'll read what I read into it, that he shouldn't have been bothered. He's so busy um, with this matter. And it really speaks to his perception of those in his chain of command, uh, particularly the sender, Captain Meidel, um, that it was ridiculous of her to send it. Now, did you have any contact with Captain Meidel regarding Corporal Conrad's email? Yes, I did. And can you tell the commissioners about that? So after I read it, it was shortly thereafter. I don't remember whether it was we met each other in the hallway after receiving it. Um, she was distressed by it. She recognized it in a similar fashion as I did, that it really attacks her ability to supervise, her ability to um, ability, competence to supervise and lead our department. Uh, what action uh, were you involved in taking after receiving the email and speaking to Captain Meidel? I, after speaking with Captain Meidel, I went and spoke with Assistant Chief Lundgren uh, about the email. He had received it. We discussed, as I said, what my perceptions were, which, not putting words in his mouth, were similar. Uh, we discussed what actions should be taken, and uh, we decided to file an internal affairs complaint uh, on this matter immediately. All right, and why immediately? Uh, the email had just come out. It had, as I said, well, it damaged the reputation of one of our captains. It damaged, again, her leadership and undermines that authority, and we wanted to take immediate corrective action so we could mitigate that damage and correct it and get us on the right course. Mm -hmm. Um, in, you know, in deciding what action to take, um, did you ever consider that, hey, you know, it's just an email. I mean, people get hundreds of emails a day. This is just an email. Why, you know, why, why not just, you know, water under the bridge? So we and I contributed to that decision. We chose to address it immediately as it's damaging uh, in a semi-militaristic organizations such as the police department where we have rank and we have order and we, we have to give uh, commands, we need to maintain that. Had this email been sent directly to Captain Meidel without sending it to all police, we could have addressed it differently. It wouldn't have had to have been addressed immediately. I don't think it wouldn't have had to have been handled the exact same way, but it was done in such a public manner that it required immediate attention. 
Uh, how did you initiate a complaint? After discussing the matter with Assistant Chief Lundgren, I believe we both went down to the Internal Affairs Office, spoke with Director McConnell, asked, her, asked them uh, to initiate an internal affairs complaint. Right. And, and who determined what policies the investigation would focus on? Uh, Assistant Chief Lundgren and I worked on those together to determine what we fit most what, which most appropriately fit this occasion. Uh, did, now, not tra Captain Meidel, but Chief Meidel, did he have any role to, uh, or part in this process? No, we, we did not include him um, in our discussions, nor in the decision to uh, initiate the IA, two reasons, uh, one of which uh, Captain Meidel is the spouse of Chief Meidel, so we didn't want that to enter into any of the discussions or decisions. Um, the other aspect is it, this particular matter didn't rise quite to, in my opinion, quite to the level of, you know, getting right on his mantle and having him involved in that decision is one that I believe we could handle at our level. Uh, was the process that you followed for initiating this complaint different than, than a process that, that, was, that was normally followed in the Spokane Police Department? Um, yes and no. I'll say no first in the sense that we went to IA and filed a complaint. I will say it was kind of different in the sense that I don't always um, look up the actual policy violations I'll take down and, and say here's, here's the allegations of the incident and let IA determine the actual policies that need to be listed as being the allegations to be violated. Um, and I guess another difference is uh, we asked for immediate action. Uh, we needed um, this to be addressed as it had just gone out. We needed it to be addressed to do, I will say, damage control. Now, if you turn to exhibit number 15 in the book, and if you turn to the, the third page in exhibit, it's actually a page on the bottom 190. So what were the potential policy violations you wanted internal affairs to consider when doing their investigation? We determined that there were two policy violations that we believe to be, have been violated, and one was um, disobedience or insubordination um, under 340.3.5, subsection D. Okay, and wh wh why that one? Uh, I believe insubordination fits um, because in, in this one here it says fail to carry out or any proper lawful order or from any supervisor in a position or authority. But I believe, I'll put it this way, insubordination or insolence done in a private one-on-one -on -one setting is insolence, right? That's, that's where you're disrespectful and stuff. But when you do insolence in front of everybody, that becomes insubordination because it undermines the authority of the entire command structure. It not only undermines Captain Meidel for sending it, but if I didn't take action, the chief's office didn't take action, it would undermine that authority. It would be basically saying that you can do that. Now, if you turn your attention to Exhibit 16, and what is the other policy violation that you wanted Internal Affairs to consider as part of their investigation? That would be Policy 212.3, Prohibited Use of Email. And why that? It says sending derogatory, defamatory, obscene, or disrespectful, uh, sexually aggressive, harassing, or any other inappropriate message on the email system. Uh, email messages addressed to the entire department are to only be used for official business related to items that are of particular interest to all. And I, I, and I don't, I believe the e email, as I said, was, it fits, you, you could say almost derogatory, defamatory, but definitely disrespectful and it was sent to all. Okay. Now, after the in internal investigation starts, do you have any role in that process? Once, once they begin, I, I do not. Okay. And are you aware that the next, the next p potential step is it goes before an ARP pod, correct? Once the investigation is completed by IA, they send it, yes, for a review. There's two different avenues that can go. One is a chain of command review, so that, you know, uh, the alleged 
perpetrator's command uh, structure gets to review it and make their recommendations. The other is for the ARP pod, our administrative review panel, to look at it and then make their recommendations to the chief office. We, this one went through ARP um, because obviously Captain Meidel is in his chain of, in Corporal Conrad's chain of command. So we wanted it removed from that and it's a group of lieutenants and captains that meet to review policy allegations, the investigation, and make a recommended finding. And, and what was your role, if at all, during the ARP pod process? I, I don't play a role in the ARP pod process at all. Okay. Uh, do you have a role in deciding, you know, after ARP makes the recommendations, uh, whether policies were violated? Usually yes, and in this case, yes. Uh, and I say that once the ARP um, writes up their recommendations or their findings, it then goes to the chief's office. Um, I'm usually CC'd on that so I can see it. There's a discussion on the investigation uh, findings, and I get to, I had the opportunity then to supply my input and recommendations both for uh, finding and uh, sanctions, if any. Now, if you could turn to Exhibit 12. And what is Exhibit 12? Uh, this is the ARP review, or their report. Uh, yep, Wait, sorry, in. nope. <laughs> sorry, one back. Look at the number on the back side. Okay. This what is the actual Exhibit 12? Okay, sorry. <laughs> exhibit 12 is actually the case finding notice. Uh, that's issued to Corporal Conrath from Chief Lundgren, Assistant Chief Lundgren. Right. And did you, did you have any role whatsoever in, in, in making the findings that are on Exhibit 12? I was allowed to give my opinion into whether the allegations should be sustained and what the sanctions should be. So I, in a discussion with Chief Lundgren, um, he asked my opinion. Um, I gave him that I believe both allegations should be sustained and I don't know if you're asking for a reason why I can give that. And yeah, uh, so are you, before first, are you aware that the ARP pod recommended uh, exonerate it for the policy on disobedience or insubordination? Yes, I am. All right. And did you did you agree with that ARP recommendation? I did not. And why why did you not agree with their recommendation for exon as a, for exonerated? So the ARP pod looked at the allegation of disobedience or insubordination nearly as like failing to carry out an order or disobedience of an order. As I said earlier, for me, this goes beyond merely the carrying out or disobedience of an order. It goes to um, the undermining of the authority of the command structure of the police department. If, if I make a remark, well, I'll, I'll just use this example. Had Corporal Conrath's remark been made directly to Captain Meidel, that would have been disrespectful and insolent, probably second allegation. But because this was sent to all police and it now incorporates, um, I, I, I go back to the same phrase, undermining the authority of Captain Meidel and of those above her and even below her if no action is taken, it goes to degrading the command structure of the department, which is insubordination. Uh, what did the ARP pod recommend for uh, misuse of email? Uh, can I go back to the other one? It just occurred no. to me. Um, and I look at that and I use the word insolence and the, I remember the ARP pod found the email to be insolent. Um, but they didn't, you know, they fell solely on the, did they, did Corporal Conrath disobey a command or fail to follow a command? That was where they solely lied. But in finding the email insolent and in that it was sent to everyone, that's how I reached my conclusion. I, should, I wanted to clarify that building upon part of their logic. Um, the second one, returning to your question, um, prohibited use of email. As I said, it was obviously a very disrespectful email that was sent through the system. So it, it fit the policy, I mean, extremely well. Okay. Um, when you were giving your opinion to Assistant Chief Gongran, had you, had you reviewed the investigation file? Yes, I had. And, and did that include uh, Exhibit 7, which is the investigative interview of Corporal Conrad? Yes, I did. All right. 
And what was your understanding of re after reading Corporal Conrad's testimony of, of, why, of, of why he sent the email <coughs> to all commissioned police officers? If you're asking for how oh, I interpret it. Uh, yeah, I'll ask a better question. Okay. How did Corporal Conrad characterize his email to all commissioned police officers? Corporal Conrad stated that this was a heartfelt apology um, that he was expressing to the rest of the police department. Okay. And did, Corp did Corporal Conrad uh, ever say that, that, he, that he sent it to everyone by mistake? So, you know, like, oh, I'm sorry, I hit reply all when I, when I meant to just reply to Captain Meinl. No. Okay. Uh, did, was your understanding that he intended to send this to, you know, approximately 400 people? Just by reading the email, yes. Okay. And obviously being sent to all police. Okay. What, what was your reaction to Corporal Conrad's uh, interview testimony that this was intended to be a sincere apology? I'd say it just furthered the disrespect and the insolence because I don't, it's, it's easy to see that in the email, it's not a heartfelt apology, but he spent his entire interview saying that it was. It just reiterated that two things. One, it was poor decision making, poor judgment, um, and he was continuing that insolence, that the arrogant attitude of I didn't do anything wrong, and the disrespect was even through that interview. Now, if you turn your attention to exhibit number 13. And what is, it, what is exhibit number 13? Exhibit 13 is a letter of reprimand from Assistant Chief Lundgren to Corporal Conrad. And were you involved on the, in the decision on what disciplinary action to take? Yes. And uh, how, how, what was your involvement? Uh, not only did Assistant Chief Lundgren afford me the opportunity to talk to my recommendations on the finding, which again, I supported the finding of sustained for both insubordination and you know, inappropriate use, excuse me, use of the email system. We also talked about what sanctions should go along with that. Um, we discussed the possibility of suspension without pay. Um, we discussed a letter of reprimand. We took into consideration um, Corporal Conrad's former or prior disciplinary action and his poor decisions making just some time prior that had been dealt with. This is slightly different. Um, it's a different demonstration of poor judgment. So using progressive discipline, we decided to um, go with letter of reprimand. Uh, were either the findings or the discipline appealed or agreed by Corporal Conrath or the union? No, they weren't. Okay. Now I'd like to turn your attention to exhibit number 17. Uh, were you involved in the decision whether to promote or pass over Corporal Conrath for the position of sergeant uh, in April 2022? Yes, that, that was my decision, which I then took to executive staff, which is made up of the chief, the assistant chief, myself, the other major, and the directors said, this is what I want to do, this is what I would like to do. It was discussed and it was agreed upon by members of the exec staff. Okay. Was, were there any dissenting opinions among those people about whether Corporal Conrad should be passed over? No. All right. And why did you decide to pass over Corporal Conrath when he was up for promotion in April of 2022? So looking at the totality of it, we, we considered, you know, the prior disciplinary action from several years ago, or the activity that happened several years ago, but the Passover and I believe it was in 21. Consider that and then looked at this one and 
I look at it as there's several attributes that we need from field supervisors, actually a number, but several key ones, you know, strong knowledge base, good decision making, uh, serve as a good example, can be a good supervisor. Um, I believe that by sending this email, the tone of the email, what was said in the email, the undermining impacts of the email, it did not demonstrate good decision making, it did not demonstrate that he could be a good role model, role model or responsible to make, uh, be a supervisor. So he was being considered for the promotion to sergeant. Um, you know, what, what, what are sergeants in the Spokane Police Department? What, what's, what's expected of them? Whew. Sergeants are our first line supervisors, first level supervisors. So they can be assigned to various units, but typically if you think about a patrol sergeant, they uh, manage, supervise, and lead because those are three different things, um, a group of officers on the street. So they're everything responsible from the administrative side of showing up for work, payroll, that sort of thing. But I mean, the importance and the heavy lifting is done on guiding officers uh, in critical situations. You have to manage and supervise and lead them as they solve issues on patrol, whether it be a barricaded subject or you're making decisions on whether an officer should make this arrest or how we should treat a particular victim. They are mentoring new officers. They are responsible for seeing officers who had deficiencies in some area and find ways to get them to improve. They're responsible for correcting if supervisors see someone that isn't doing the most appropriate or just plain inappropriate activity, how does, how does that supervisor address it? Is it something they can do again through coaching or mentoring or is it through something in a disciplinary process where it requires uh, the formal IA? It, it's the whole gamut of supervising and leading a group of individuals. And what do you, do you consider good judgment to be a necessary prerequisite to serving as a sergeant? It's key. And what, why? Well, everything from the decisions made, uh, boy, it, it, and that gamut is wide, whether it's, you know, are we arresting this person, are we letting this person go, are we placing this person with CPS or the child, or are we removing them from the home? So there's a lot of external situations. How do you um, handle a barricaded subject, a suicidal subject, a person with mental challenges? Uh, there's all sorts of gamuts of that part that you need to be able to make sound, logical decisions that are for the good of the individual, but good for the city and organization as well. And then that goes as well to dealing with individuals. You have to make sound judgment, good decisions as you're dealing with individuals, as I said recognizing deficiencies, rec praising good work. You need to make good decisions constantly because your group of officers assigned to you depend on you as well as the city. Hmm. So uh, given that judgment is so important, why did you think that, that the sending of the email that's at exhibit number four and the investigation and discipline that resulted from it uh, demonstrated that Corporal Conrad doesn't have the judgment you're looking for? I believe the, the email demonstrates a lack of judgment as we're talking about on the sense that it is snarky, it's disrespectful, it undermines authority and uh, the chain of command, it um, is demoralizing to the department uh, because it, it tears down everybody, it doesn't just tear down that one person, it tears down everybody within the organization. It's, it's not something I'm sure it's something that felt good at the time and, you know, to vent, um, but it's not good judgment. We don't make decisions based on, you know, what is good for me right now. We make just, supervisors must make decisions based on what's the best decision for the people involved for our organization. Uh, uh, did Corporal Conrath appeal uh, the decision to pass him over in April of 2022? No, he did not. Okay. So can you turn your attention to exhibit number 18? And what is exhibit number 18? It's um, an email to our chief examiner, Ms. Pearson, um, notifying her that we intend to pass Corporal Conrath over a second time for the position of sergeant. All right, and is there any different reasons for this decision than the previous one we just discussed? 
No, no difference. All right. If you turn your attention to exhibit number 19, did Corporal Conrath appeal that second Passover? No. No, he did not. Oh, wait. Uh, on this one, on 19, yes, I'm sorry. As the first one, he didn't appeal. The second one, he did. Yep. Okay. Now, if you turn to exhibit number 20, And what is exhibit number 20? Uh, number 20 is an email from Chief Examiner Pearson to Corporal Conrath uh, with an official notification to pass over for cause on the third opportunity for promotion. And was there any different decisions to pass him over that time than there were for the others? No. All right. And, and is, is Corporal Conrath permanently disqualified uh, from receiving a promotion to sergeant? No. And ex explain that. So, and I'm going to go back a little bit. So I know that had this incident not come up, when Corporal Conrath came up for promotion uh, the first time back in April, had this not occurred, we probably would have had a dis decision whether there was enough time span between prior past bad judgments to that one. Um, that was a minor, a component of the decision, but when this came forward, it demonstrated that no, he has not been able to consistently demonstrate solid and reliable good judgment to the point where we wanted to promote him to sergeant. Um, does that answer the question, I believe? It does. Okay. Uh, if you turn your attention to exhibit number 22. And if you go to sort of the, the bottom of the third page and the top of the fourth page. So first, do you, do you recognize these, the, uh, this document? This is portions of the Merit System Rules of Civil Service Commission for the City of Spokane. Right. And these are um, part of the rules that allows us um, the ability for cause um, to pass someone over for a promotion. Okay, and looking at, looking at the, the, the third page, there's, there's some factors at the top. Uh, which of these did you think was basically implicated in your decision to pass them over uh, for the times that are being appealed today? Um, I believe number one fits an eligible documented substandard work performance. Um, I believe number two qualifies an eligible documented prior disciplinary problems, um, an el or documented errors in an eligible judgment, um, and any other document performance related issues. I think, like I said, if we take in consideration the, the prior Passover, not from this list, but from the past list, which I know would not have been enough necessarily to pass them over, but there probably would have been dis discussion about it. Um, but when we take this incident um, with, again, the continued to inability to make good decisions, it definitely reinforces that we're not at a point. Um, so it demonstrated errors in the eligible's judgment as probably the highlighted there, but I, I believe it just shows the pattern that here's the cause that we're passing them over for. I have one more question for you, and I don't, I don't know if you're the right person to ask this of, but, but there was testimony when Captain Mido was testifying about Corporal Conrath serving as an acting sergeant. Uh, is that your understanding of what's been, ha what's been happening? So when, when a sergeant is absent, uh, so the, our command structures, you have officers, corporals, and then sergeant. When the sergeant is gone, the corporal gets paid a 3% bump to kind of fill in that role. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about what is the definition of a corporal um, as um, what those roles and responsibilities are. So he did receive that, you know, that pay while his sergeant was gone to fill in that role, but there was still supervisors on that shift that were actually supervising um, the activities that were going on. 
Right. So to your knowledge, has, has Corporal Conrath ever been placed in the position of acting sergeant? No. And, and is that, that, that issue about you know, corporals getting the pay bumped when their sergeant is gone, is that how, where does that come from? That's governed by our contract. And that is all the questions I have for right now. Mr. Coleman? Uh -huh. Can you take a noon recess? We'd really prefer not to since we had to start so late. <clears throat> um, I think at the conclusion of uh, Major Olson, we'll take a 15 minute break. Well, Corporal Conrath has been working as an out-of-grade sergeant, correct? No, there's a difference between out-of-grade and being paid 3% uh, when your sergeant is absent. So he's never worked as an out-of-grade sergeant? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. And so you said when the sergeant's gone, the corporals, what do they do then? They're responsible for you know, getting uh, tell staff updated, trying to make sure that they're staffing. Um, They make sure the team has their roll calls, information from roll calls disseminated, but typically there's rarely an instance where there's like a whole roll call and only the corporal's present. There's still supervisors there that are responsible. What supervisors would there be? Uh, what would their rank be, I guess? Sergeants. So there's other sergeants? Yes, other sergeants from uh, teams that would be starting at the same time. So, so for a team, if a sergeant is gone, and the corporal is doing those duties, what does that refer to that as SPD? What is SPD's word for that? Um, so when we ask someone to be, well, I don't, I don't know, there's, there's two different terms because he's not being paid out of grade. Mm -hmm. It's like he gets the 3% bump. That, I mean, that's what he gets. And so just sergeant goes sick and he doesn't have to do anything else and they just get a 3% bump just because the sergeant's gone? Well, like I said, they're responsible for making sure tell staff's done. They can't answer, there's cer certain questions that they can answer by their troops if they're capable and have the knowledge base to do so. Um, but the... So what is an out of grade sergeant? That's when we ask someone, and it's usually the next person up on a sergeant's list, we actually pay them as a sergeant to fill a role as a sergeant, but they're not formally promoted through the civil service um, sometimes due to the fact that it's only going to be a temporary promotion um, or something along those lines. We don't do those very often anymore. Right. And I don't know if you were here, but so it's your testimony that that hasn't been done for Corporal Conrad, that he has not performed work as an out-of-grade sergeant? He was not paid an out, as out-of-grade sergeant, no. Has he performed that work? Not the same. I don't believe he's entering blue teams and doing the other things that are being done. So as a sergeant, he's, he's never provided the support to a team or filled in that supervisory role that a sergeant Trisha would do when a sergeant is absent? He, there's definitely portions of a sergeant's job that are done by a corporal when the sergeant's not there. And so, has Corporal Conrath done that? Yes. <sighs> We go back to this previous matter uh, of these inappropriate relationships. What was the discipline that he had based upon that complaint, that civil complaint? I would have to go back and look because uh, I don't remember exactly. I do believe, I would have to go back and look. I would be speculating, sorry. Were you a part of that? I believe I was. And. Were you part of the decision to pass him over for sergeant that time? If that, was, if that was a portion of that process, I would have been, yes. And that was a civil issue, correct? That complaint was civil in nature, it wasn't criminal? I don't believe it was criminal, I don't remember. I don't remember if there was a criminal investigation done first. I do believe there might have been that component initially. But it wasn't criminal. 
It was a civil complaint, correct, Major Olson? I will say I have to go back and look. <laughs> but since there are no charges filed, I would say yes. And SPD's own internal policy has a time bar on civil complaints, correct? Of a year? I don't know where that's at. You don't, you're unaware of that? You're unaware of the SPD policy that says civil complaints outside of a year are unactionable, they're time barred? If you're talking about accepting complaints, but there's a, a difference between accepting complaints and acting upon them. And then was so, that complaint later withdrawn? Um, that was the basis of all that to do with the last appeal? I don't believe so. And was the art pod told to disregard the time bar policy and to push forward in that last matter? I do not know what guidance was given to the art pod. Okay. And then, how many times has Corporal Conroth been passed over now? From this list, three times, based on, on and, this incident. And he's test out as number one in the promotional list, right? I don't know where he came out on the initial list. I mean, it came down to where he was number one. I don't know that he was number one initially. I, I don't remember. SPD ever deal with emails before that might, well, that you might not like or command staff might not like? It's called spicy emails. I'm sure we have. Does it always trigger an IA? Not always, not all of them rise to that level. How many have? I, you're asking the wrong person, I don't know. Would it be safe to say, based upon your understanding, that this is the only one? There have been some egregious emails that may have made into IA that I was unaware of. But based upon your knowledge, this is the only one. Let me rephrase. Can you think of another one? Not at this moment. This reprimand letter uh, was held on to the 180th day, the uh, last possible day to resolve an IA. Is that correct? I don't know the timeline. How many times have you, as a major, uh, gone to IA over an email? How many times? Have, have you, you got an IA? You got an email? You, you went right down to IA. There's been two that have attracted my attention. Only one where I've gone, I think only one where I've gone down as a major. Yep. And that was this one? Yes. Um, and then. I'm looking at policy. All right. So let's go with the prohibited use of bail one. So, if I'm understanding this right, Captain Bidell sent a letter to all commissioned officers, an email, that said, once again, I'm reminding you about this. And that's the email that triggered the response from Corporal Conrad. Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. And so, <coughs> is the problem the language here or the subjective context that we derive from it without any human element, or is it the fact that it went to everybody? What's the issue with this email? I would say uh, the language that I believe is blatantly, easily interpreted to be disrespectful, insolent, it went to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that it was derogatory in nature. Now, derogatory in nature, um, as to whom? If you undermine the authority of Captain Meidel, I would say it was aimed at her, um, as well as the rest of the chain of command, as it was not, it was not addressed to Captain Meidel, but it addressed an email from Captain Meidel, belittling the email. So it's safe to say this was official business. And because Captain Meidel sent the email, there's a particular interest to all, um, wasn't obscene, 
Do you think it was disrespectful? Yes. It wasn't sexist of Dreiser. Did you find it harassing? I don't know that I would qualify it as harassing. All right. Folks, may I have one moment? Be my client, thank you. <laughs> I think it's yours. I'm good with this one. Thank it's all you. you. I'll take a share of that. Good. With you? Yes. All right. Please, Commission. Okay, real quick now. All right, so the payroll program. Uh, are you familiar with that, the SPD uses? Telestaff? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm sorry. Once again, Counselor, I didn't catch any of that. Oh, I'm sorry. The payroll program is called Telestaff. Okay. It's used by SPD. Um, and so, you know what it looks like. So, what's power shift? The shift that starts at, I believe, 4 o'clock. Okay. And, Corporal Conrad, part of power shift? I believe he was, yeah. I don't know if he's still, um, but we don't have it the same configuration now, so. All right. And then if I could just, so, if I may approach you. Hmm. Please. says, out of grade corporal as acting sergeant. And so, and this is Daniel G. Lesser. That's one of our, well, one of our sergeants. And so, would that be the person who made this entry? It looked like it from, I don't use the mobile app, so I had trouble interpreting the way that one's laid out. So what is an out-of-grade corporal as an acting sergeant? So, again, this is where I would have to have someone verify. I don't believe he was ever proved to be an out-of-grade because that requires us to send something to civil service to say we're going to pay this person out-of-grade as a supervisor as opposed to the 3%. So just help me with that. No, let's, let's just remove Corporal Conrath from the situation. What does the phrase out-of-grade corporal as acting Sergeant Meade. Well, it doesn't necessarily... Again, I don't know if that's referring to him receiving 3% as the out-of-grade um, because he's working as a sergeant, you know, filling in because the sergeant's absent. Um, because we can have officers be out-of-grade uh, because if they're the next up on the civil service list, those are the individuals that we will usually choose to be the next out of grade sergeant because they're the next in line. So we you know, start working on getting them trained in the experience of working as a sergeant. So looking at that telestaff entry, I don't know if it was the 3% that is given on a daily basis um, in a sergeant's absence. Cause I know um, Corporal Conrath's sergeant was gone for an extended period of time due to injury. I believe his injury um, versus us making a formal, this is going to be an out of grade position. So when his sergeant was gone, Corporal Conrath was the out of grade corporal working as an acting sergeant. That's how SBD would record it. In telestaff. In telestaff. And it's out of grade corporal working as acting sergeant because the sergeant's gone and he's working as the acting sergeant. He's filling in for the sergeant, yes, and there still are other supervisors on that shift. So when there's men down and SPD needs him, Corporal Conrath is tapped to be the out-of-grade corporal as the acting sergeant. So know that if his sergeant took a week's of vacation, his sergeant said, I'm gone for the week, he would get that 3% pay. If he's gone for, he's got the cold, he's going to get that 3% no. pay. Anytime a sergeant's gone for basically any reason, he gets a 3% increase in pay. 
Um, and there's a difference between that and the formal, we are going to make you an out of grade sergeant. So I think we got the 3% pay thing covered. What I want to know is they get that pay because the sergeant's gone and this corporal's working as the acting sergeant. Within some capacities, yes, but not, there's not a full expectation of that. And there's been a lot of discussion with our, uh, our union around the roles of corporals and what supervisory tasks they're allowed to do, what functions that we expect of them to do as a, as a corporal in so the 3% role. he shows enough to be the stand-in sergeant when he's needed, but passed over for promotion um, because of these perceived deficiencies. As a corporal, without making another sergeant come in and take that role because his sergeant was temporarily out, they automatically fill that role. But because someone was out, he gets that pay. So it wasn't, it wasn't as if we said, we want you to be the sergeant, sergeant out of grade, like where we asked for that out of grade special designation. It was, you're filling in by contract, you're the corporal on this team, you're gonna fill in in your sergeant's absence. And that's the way that one worked. That's for the pay, the three percent. All right. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Commissioners, questions? Yes. I have one question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Just so I'm 100 percent clear, Major. The three uh, percent, or rather, which seems to be more germane to Councilor's point, is the. Um, expectation to cover some of the sergeant's duties as a corporal is automatic, correct? Correct. There's no discretion involved there? The, no. I mean, it, when the sergeant's gone, that's just automatically contractually given. So sergeant's out on vacation, the next corporal in line takes over some of these duties as you've described to us today. The, the corporal assigned to that team. Assigned to that team. Yes. Okay. And that's what happened in... Um, Corporal Conrath's situation, as I understand it, correct? Yeah, yes. Okay. So no one is actually saying, oh, we would really like him to do this. This is what is expected in his chain of command in his position. Correct. As any other corporal in that position. Correct. Okay. My, my question is pretty much on that same line. You may have just answered it. Um, when you have a corporal that fills in for a sergeant... Um, are the, the salary and the duties not somewhat negotiated in your contract uh, uh, as to what all can be asked of that individual? Uh, for instance, in the street department, let's use that as an example. If someone is an M1, fills in for an M2, uh, they, do, they do either some or a portion of the M2, whatever has been negotiated. Uh, if there is that raise or that that change during vacation or sick leave or whatever, is that would you say that's basically what happens? I here? would say that's basically it. It's contract. The pay is contractually negotiated, um, and it's articulated. And the expectation is he fills in for that supervisor on some of the tasks that have to be done during that time. Like, yes. So there would be still be some things that perhaps. A fill-in sergeant would not do that a full-time sergeant would do. Correct. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Last one from me anyway, Major. Is, is passing over the first person on the list, when that happens, that Passover, is that considered a disciplinary tool? I don't consider it a disciplinary tool. It's trying to find, we need to ensure that the right person is going to fill the role. Right, so it's not disciplinary. Correct. Thank you. A couple of quick questions, and uh, Major, feel free to punt these to the AC if you'd like to. Okay. Um, in kind of summarizing city attorney or city council, mentioned earlier that it was Chief Meidel's intent that not to permanently preclude uh, Corporal Conrath from ever being promoted, but he wanted to see a period of time where performance was acceptable before consideration for promotion. Is that correct? Yes. And even from my perspective or the chiefs, yes. Yeah. So my question of that is, and this is the one you might want to punt, my question is, how long? How long does he have to go before the decision is that 
He now exercises consistent good judgment and discretion and et cetera. That's a good question. And I think it relies upon time. Uh, it is, it's a question of time. It's, had this been a once, had we seen one poor decision from Corporal Conrath, that time would, frame would be shorter. We have a prior history of poor judgment, poor decisions. And then we again see poor decisions that have um, demonstrate the inability to make sound judgments on a consistent basis. So I didn't know he, he did not take this last test. I didn't know he wasn't going to take the last test. I don't know that on this new list that's out, he would have been precluded. It would have had to have been another topic of discussion. It's, it truly is position by position, how soon and how recent. So um, it's, it's, it's not one I can put a, a, um, a bright line on, well, you know, this line, because it, it's just too hard to predict. So we're using past behavior to predict where we are. And so with this couple decisions and this one being as recent as this, when we made the last pass over last November, that was too recent. I'm not the AC, but let me give a shot at the answer. I don't believe it would be an issue of time, individually and discreetly, only time. It's the nature of the decisions that are made during that time. Correct. And the demonstration of growth and maturity and responsibility in the decision-making process. So it's a combination. It's quantitative and qualitative. That, that's what I meant. I'm sorry. And I meant to include the fact that we need to see that pattern of it's because in my, in my mind's eye, it's not only the, deci the poor decisions, right, marked here, say marked here, but then as we go forward, it's not just time, but it's <clears throat> has there been any more bad decisions and have the decisions been good decisions since then? So thank you. Sure. Absolutely. And, you know, and I, I didn't phrase it that way, but that's where I was going. But um, so from, again, paraphrasing what I've heard, um, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, part of the decision was based on maturity. Is that correct? Correct. Discretion. Yes. Judgment. Yes. The ability to lead properly. Correct. So I guess that leads me to the next question is, I'm kind of curious is, as an assistant team leader, why is he still a corporal? So when we look, I guess it goes back to discipline. And maybe this is one that I will ask the assistant chief or if someone else wants to just, I look at it this way. He received discipline for a prior poor decision a little while back. Demonstrates now another poor decision, receives discipline that is progressive in nature. Um, while it's somewhat different from this one, it still shows a lack of good judgment. We, using progressive discipline, thought letter was best. I think the other, to go to demotion, because they were, one is, if, to be blunt, is inappropriate relationships with DV victims. This one is sending out an email that is snarking, insolent, and, and disrespectful and undermines the authority. Kind of two different things. So using progressive discipline, that's how we came upon the decision of letter of reprimand. But understand that, you know, <laughs> future lapses in judgment that demonstrate that type of decision-making would probably result in uh, other progressive discipline. Thank you. If I answered your question. You did, thank okay. you. Any other questions, Commission? Mr. Kuhlman, did you have something you wanted to add? So, do we remember the discipline then with this inappropriate relationship, what he received? So we're talking about discipline a lot. We're saying discipline. We're saying DV victim. We're saying big, scary words. So what happened with it? I am not 100% sure. I know there was a sanction. I believe the sanction was... I, and again, when I say I believe, I'm going to say I believe there was um, a letter of reprimand, but also denial of promotions or something. And again, that's why I'm saying I believe. I don't have it in front of me to look at it to say. And, and was it a DV victim? I... That's my recollection. And wasn't that complaint withdrawn? And wasn't that time barred by the year policy? And again, I don't, I, I'm not going to speak to either one of well, those. I'd have to do more digging to see either of those. You said discipline in this commission. 
You don't know what the discipline is? I, I know he received discipline. I can't articulate to the full extent of it. And this is the uh, past year old complaint that can't be actioned on. It can't be initi initiated. Correct. Yep. That was initiated. Okay. And you're pretty sure you received discipline on it? I'm pretty sure. You could... <clears throat> I would have to go back and look at the file. I did not pull that file. But, but, I, just... but I do know that it demonstrated the poor judgment that I'm basing these decisions on for Passover. So you spoke earlier about you believe some of the discipline was denial of his promotion? The prior. Prior? I believe so. And now we're using that again to deny this motion, this, this promotion. Um, we're using that same information. It's, it's coming into it. I would say it definitely is showing that pattern of not solid decision right. making. So he's getting disciplined, redisciplined, over the same thing, even though it's already been actioned on. And again, I will go back to, I believe, Commissioner Palmerton that stated, is this discipline? No, this is a decision based on who do we pick for the best candidate. So I'm looking at lapse of judgment there, and I'm looking at lapse of judgment here. It doesn't SPD traditionally run on a system in a culture where first person on the list gets the job for sergeant. And then how traditionally SPD's gone? On, for the list of sergeant, it's a rule of one. Rule of one. And what is the rule of one? That you will promote the person off the first of the list unless you pass them over for cause. Mm -hmm. And how many times has Corporal Cotterath been the one, not gotten the benefit of the rule of one, and been passed over? On this last list, three. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Major. Um, quick question for you. I, I assume there's a review process that occurs within the corporal um, uh, designation, like a yearly review. So that's one of the position. That's one of the roles that like our corporals don't do and are, are never expected to do, is the annual review, and that is written by a sergeant. So um, Corporal Conrad's <clears throat> sergeant would have written those annual reviews. So has, has the corporal had an annual review of his own performance? Uh, yeah, I'm sure he has. We've made sure all those reviews are done yearly. Okay, and his sergeant would have been the person that gave him that review each year? Yes. And are you privy to the review uh, contents? They don't rise to my level. Um, sounds awful. I have 200-ish plus people that I supervise. So the way that works is a sergeant will write the review for the officers and corporals under his chain of command. He'll write it, send it to his lieutenant for review. The lieutenant will sign off on it and send it back. So unless there's some other issue, that's as far as the command would go for that review. Is the review uh, process considered when passing over um, under the rule of one? It can be. Okay. So the contents could be considered when passing someone over for cause? That would be one thing that would be taken, could be taken into consideration. And in this particular case, was it? I did not pull his annual reviews. Okay. So I would have to say I did not look at it. Uh, and as far as you know, did anyone else? I, I don't know. Okay, is there somebody that would know that instead of you, in your opinion? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Major Olson. Did we want to take a 15 minute break? I'm good with a fast one. Okay, or, okay. Uh, uh, okay let's go ahead and take a five minute break. We'll Thank be you. Back. We'll be back. We'll in, be adjourned uh, for five minutes. Thank you. At uh, 1230.
and a half. We will reconvene the commission at this time. We're going to, everybody has agreed to try to uh, uh, get done in a more, uh, time, as timely a manner as possible as we have a commissioner uh, with pressing business that he must get to. So um, let's, let's begin. Mr. Bolasini, you can call your next witness. Uh, that would be Justin Lundgren. And is it my understanding that we have a, we have a stop today at one? Yes. Is it, okay. We have a stop at one today. We're going to try and push through and get all the testimony done today. Um, we will not be doing deliberations today. So more to come after 1 p.m. today. We'll get something scheduled for a special meeting notice, and et cetera. But, um, yeah, we're going to try and push through and get everybody done today. Okay. So uh, I'm going to do an abbreviated version. <laughs> Thank you. Let me swear, but, Mr. Err, let me swear, <laughs> Assistant Chief Lundgren, in real quick. Good morning, sir. Okay. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in the matter now being heard will be the truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Can you please state your name for the record? Justin Lundgren. And your current position? Uh, I'm the Assistant Chief. And how long in that position of Assistant Chief? Uh, about six and a half years. And how long with the Spokane Police Department? I have uh, 20, uh, 25 and a half years. Okay. And did you, did you hear uh, Major Olson testify as to the, the process for the initiation of the investigation? I did. And briefly, briefly <clears throat> what, was, what was your role in that process? I, I conferred with uh, Major Olson um, about the email. Uh, we went down together to Internal Affairs. We selected... Um, uh, the appropriate uh, uh, policies to be investigated uh, under this circumstance, and, um, and that ended our initial our initial involvement. Okay, now I'm going to take you to the art pod, <laughs> you, and you remember receiving the recommendations from the art pod. I do, yes. And and what was the, what was the recommendation with respect to the policy on disobedience or insubordination? Uh, the art came to the conclusion that the uh, that the behavior was insolent, but it didn't rise to the level of insubordination. And did you agree with that? I did not. And, and, and what, what, what was your finding? So I, I found it sustained on the insubordination. And can you explain to the commissioners why you sustained that violation as well? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. So <clears throat> the process that we're talking about using uh, self-insured on, on the collision forms was an ongoing issue that had uh, prior direction had been uh, provided by Captain Meidel and presumably others on the proper way to, to perform this process when we had a city-involved vehicle involved in a collision. So when she sent out that, that further reminder, that directive, um, that is her issuing an order. It's an order to the people under her command, this is the way that this needs to be done. So when, when Corporal Conrath he, you can understand why um, in his situation he may have made a mistake and he, he may have oversaw um, a, a report and not picked up on that, on that, uh, on that error. Um, however, he didn't do his job correctly. He did not do what he was supposed to do. The all police email was, a, was an order, was a directive by a captain that said how you're supposed to do things. And he took exception to it. It was obvious in the tone and the, and the verbiage of his email that he was confronting the captain. Um, you can tell that he feels that this was a minuscule type of offense, that he is, um, he is uh, uh, not happy that, this, that he's received emails related to this. Um, and we, so he, he not only... Um, he not only takes exception to it, but the tone and uh, the disrespect that's shown in that email is magnified because he sends it to the entire commission department. Um, it'd be bad enough it was all patrol. This is the entire, everybody that wears a badge received this email with his opinions. It talked about what the weather was like when he was working, 
how long he had to work that night, how many shifts he had to cover. <clears throat> if, it was a, if it was an inconvenience for the department to receive Captain Meidel's directive that said the proper way to do their, uh, your job when you're, when you're responding to uh, a city-owned vehicle collision, it certainly was an inconvenience that everybody that was commissioned had to read an email with his opinions and everything about his shift the night before. Most people probably had no idea why he was sending it. Mm. And but why did why did you why did you think that this was was uh, insubordination? Because it, it involved an order directive. She was uh, at that time was his captain, which is his boss's boss's boss. Um, the tone and manner of the email, and then to send it to everybody. So now he's drawing an audience where he can he can demonstrate this disrespect towards his superior officer. And why did you why did you think his email demonstrated disrespect? Let me say exhibit number four. So part of it you'd have to you have to take the email and then later he talks about it in his internal affair interview as well. But um, I'm afraid I owe you all an apology. Uh, he talks about the mistake that he made. Fortunately, though, I received six emails today to remind me of my repeated failures to supervise. <clears throat> he received two, two emails related to this, one from Captain Meidel that was in the small group involved in the chain of command, one that went to uh, the all police commission that, I, that I'm aware of that were related to this. Um, it's clear that he, he feels put upon that he received the emails that he did about this topic. In his IA interview, he talks about how um, collision reviews are one of the, the lower important items that he deals with. So he doesn't view this as a big deal. Um, and it, his, his interview with IA also, um, I mean, I, I just have to say, <clears throat> There's, there's a little bit of formality in our organization. Um, on, on a patrol team, if you're speaking to your sergeant, particularly if you're in public, you might, you might call them Sarge, or you might call them Sergeant. A lieutenant might be Lieutenant or LT. When you go to an IA interview where you are accused of insubordination to your captain, and then you call her by her, her first name when you're addressed in a question um, referring to her as Captain Meidel, it shows the thought process and the deliberate um, disrespect. That's just, uh, that's, I don't know um, from your backgrounds if that's, uh, if you know anybody in the military or, or in police or maybe even in fire, that's just not something that is done. It's, it's, a, it's a disrespect that is very subtle and, and that much the same way that this email is, is kind of a subtlety, but everybody that received it understood the significance of the message. Um. Are you familiar with the prior investigations of Corporal Conrath for, for relationships with the women he met while responding to calls? I am, yes. And, and was, there, was, was there any discipline imposed with, with respect to those two investigations? Yes, so the, the first investigation, um, I believe was when Chief uh, DeBro was chief. Um, it was uh, conduct unbecoming and, and inappropriate uh, uh, relationship, he received 30 day, uh, 30 day suspension. I believe that was in 2015. Um, approximately five years later, the department was contacted by a man who accused Corporal Conrad of having uh, an affair with his um, estranged wife at the time. So we were, we were unaware that at the same time that this other inappropriate investigation or an inappropriate uh, uh, relationship was occurring there actually was this this other relationship that we were unaware of at that time five years later it comes to light and um, uh, we uh, investigated that complaint it was outside of the one-year timeline that we've we've talked about today so there was no sanction there was no discipline but we had a duty to 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 look into the complaint um, <coughs> And we, we've heard, you know, was this civil, was this criminal? When someone <clears throat> comes forward with a complaint of that nature, you, you don't know if it's going to be civil or criminal until you ask the questions, you contact the witnesses, and, and you find out what the nature of the relationship is. In this case, um, um, 
without using names or anything, I, I feel comfortable saying that uh, this particular individual at that particular time in her life was going through some uh, substance abuse issues that um, were very, very serious, life-threatening, according to her estranged husband, to the point that um, you know, we, have to, we have to determine if she was um, a willing participant in this, if it occurred, um, and so we did. And at the end of the day, um, it would have constituted policy violations. It did constitute policy violations, but it wasn't something we could take action on because of the limitations of the policy, if that makes sense. Uh, did you consult with uh, Major Olson on his decision to pass over Corporal Conrath for the position of sergeant? I did. And, and is, is, there, is there a difference in your mind between the standard for imposing discipline and the standard impo for you know, pro deciding whether somebody should get the next promotion to sergeant? There is. Um, so when we promote someone to sergeant, we're giving them additional responsibility. We're giving them additional authority. We're giving them authority over other employees, um, and we're giving them responsibilities that are really important to the functioning and our, our um, view within the public. And so there's, there's an, a necessary element of maturity, um, subject matter knowledge. There has to be, um, I mean, you have to comply with the policies if you're going to enforce the policies. If you're going to teach officers how they're supposed to behave, you have to model behavior. And you have to show good judgment. Um, there, we can't, we've got almost a thousand pages of policy. We cannot write everything into a policy. We need first line supervisors who can respond to a call, who can look at a situation, and can weigh facts that may not be written in black and white and make a decision that's the best under the circumstances for the information that they have. And so, absolutely, it is, it's imperative that we put people who demonstrate those qualities into these positions. And so, um, it, it, is not a, it is not a disciplinary matter. It's finding the right person to fit that position for the department and for the city. Hmm. Did you agree with Major Olson that Corporal Conrad should, be, should have been passed over uh, for the sergeant positions at issue in this appeal? I, I do. I, I did and I do. And why? Because um, I think we're lacking, I, I think there's demonstrated behavior that is not mature. I think there's um, decision making that, that wasn't um, serious breaches of decision making at the level that he currently occupied. Um, and, and then, <clears throat> When you have the, fir the first time he has passed over and he appealed um, to, to the commission, his, his appeal was denied. Um, then within just a matter of a couple of months, then one of the, the, the author of the ARP in, in one of those investigations, as well as a witness in the, before, before you all in the commission in that appeal process is now the subject of this email. It just all goes to show that he's not in a place where he's able to, to lead a team, in, in my estimation. Uh, that is the end of my, sh my short and direct. Thank you, Mr. Bolasina. Mr. Coleman? <clears throat> we have nothing for this one. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Commissioners, questions for Assistant Chief Lundgren? No, I have none. Thank you. I just have one. Sure. Um, in light of the discussions you had regarding uh, Corporal Conrad's promotability to the position of sergeant, was any discussion um, ever, uh, I guess, was there any consideration about promoting him and then using the prescribed probationary period to see if he was capable of, of uh, making that a permanent promotion versus a probationary proponent? Just curious if that discussion ever took place. No, I, I think in this, in this instance, um, uh, Major Olson and I both were of the opinion that it, it just wasn't a good time for him. Um, that probationary period is a period of six months, and it certainly is um, is a way to to test drive someone who appears like they may, they may be ready. Um, I, I didn't want to we didn't want to set him up for failure. Um, I think that. Uh, you know, our patrol officers are, are 
they do a tremendous job for the community. They, they face all these different um, pretty complex issues. And I, I just, um, I didn't think it would be a, a good idea to give them a test run at this time. Thank you. You bet. Uh, yes, I too have the elusive one question. Sure. Uh, let me ask you this. If we look at just the conduct with the email, the decision to change the subject line, the decision to reply all, the decision to send the email when he did, would that have been sufficient cause to pass over, in your opinion? If it was, if uh, otherwise his disciplinary history was completely free of any, any type of findings? Is or not even considered, yes. Uh, I hadn't really, I hadn't really thought of it from that perspective. Um, I, I don't know that it, that it would be. Um, however, I, I will add that I was, um, I was a little bit surprised when he went in for his IA interview that there was not an acknowledgement that, yes, I was frustrated when I wrote the email. Yes, it probably wasn't the best idea. Um, I do feel all the things I wrote here, um, but. Instead, he, he insisted upon, um, he, he stayed real consistent with, it's a sincere apology. I'm not sure why everybody's making a big deal about this. And so, um, so I, don't, I don't know the answer to your question. I, I have to think about that for a while. Okay, fair enough. The, um, are you aware of where the corporal was located? In other words, uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. Was it his, was it the corporal's day off when he responded to the email? Uh, I believe that uh, he responded um, prior to his shift. I believe he had worked the night before and responded to the email during the day prior to respond, reporting to work then that following night. Right, because in the interview, there was some discussion about you, you worked and then you went to hit the sack or there was some verbiage like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so can we assume that when he, when he did respond to this email, he was doing it outside of office hours, if you will? Yes. Okay, so it was when he was not officially acting as a corporal in the police department. Well, I would say he was on a city email system communicating with members of the department. So uh, while he was not in a paid status, I would, I would argue that he was um, operating on behalf of the department at that point. Sure, but what I'm trying to understand is, was it on his time off? I, I believe so. Okay. I believe so. So he has access to email when he's not, you know, I'm gonna call it in the office, but access to email when he's at home. Correct. When he's not officially working at the, at the time. Correct. So he could have waited to respond to the email when he was back in the precinct or working at his desk. He could have, yes. Okay, but instead he responded while he, after he just woke up from a double shift. Correct. Okay, I think he said in his interview, and I wanna make sure I'm clear on this, that he um, didn't feel particularly that frustration was the motivator, but rather fatigue. Uh, he attributed uh, fatigue and, and maintained that um, the purpose and, and tone of the, of the email was truly a, an apology. He maintained that throughout the investigation. Right, and he, I think he also indicated that he didn't really put much thought into it, that he just sort of replied, right? Yes. Would you consider that good judgment? Uh, no, okay. no I would not. And, in, and actually I think if I remember also correctly in the interview, he agreed that he did exercise poor judgment, right? I'd have to go back and look uh, exactly. Um, I, I think if, I, if my memory serves it, it was um, since I'm here in IA, the, I think the tone of the response was something along the lines of I'm here in, in internal affairs, so uh, maybe I, I didn't do everything I, the way I sh wish I would have. Um, and I think he repeatedly, he repeatedly said knowing now what he knows now, he would never do that again, right? Yes. So that suggests that he understand he understands that what he did was in poor judgment. Yes. Let me follow up on that as well. Was an email required 
uh, reference this directive sent out by the captain? No. And no. Of I, the 385 commission positions that you have, how many other people wrote a reply all to the captain? I don't. Um, by my recollection, there was um, there was a one reply that I remember seeing to Corporal Conrath's email, um, consoling him and saying, "Don't worry, you didn't let me down." That sort of thing. It was it was rather tongue in cheek as well. I think that was Detective Harvey that had sent that. Any further questions, commissioners? Yes, last one. Um, why do we care about police reports? Um, police reports. That is the police reports that is, are the foundation of the of the job we do. Um, you know, in this particular case, this error doesn't take away from the content of the report. What it does is it creates um, a situation where private insurers believe that they're dealing with an insurance company that has responsibility and they initiate a claim process. And so a lot of people, um, a lot of people do have to invest time in that and then they have to undo that process when they realize that they're supposed to be do dealing with um, our, our city employee instead of uh, a private insurance company. So um, it is important. And, and it, police reports, are they public record? Yes, they are. And anyone can look them up anytime for $10.50, right? You can make a request and they'll, they will make the redactions that are uh, appropriate and anyone can get any record that they're eligible to receive. Do we feel it's important for sergeants to be, uh, to have a high level of attention to detail? Yes, yes ma'am. And the police report is something that comes directly from the police department, right? That is correct. And so a lack of attention to detail in a police report is reflective, I would think, on the entire department. Yes. And an email suggesting uh, that folks need to be a little, have a little more attention to detail would be an important police matter. Yes, uh, yeah, and it's a good, email is not perfect, but it is, it is one of the only ways that you can guarantee that every single person receives a, an important piece of information. And if a, an employee of the police department feels that they're inappropriately shifted or working too many hours, is that an overall commissioned officer um, topic? Well, it, it certainly is a morale issue, um, but using the, the email system in this way to complain about, about that um, doesn't do, uh, it just doesn't do anything for morale. It, it doesn't have a positive impact. Are there chains of command that are out there for officers or corporals or any other employee of the police department for which they can make complaints that they feel they're being overworked or that their shift hours are too long? I mean, are there mechanisms for that? Absolutely. And, and is part of that mechanism a, a, a police department-wide email? No. No, it would not be. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Mr. Coleman, did you have something? Chief. Hi, Joe Coleman. Hi. I just want to ask, um, <clears throat> Can you speak into the microphone? What was Detective Harvey's discipline mm -hmm. for responding? Uh, Detective Harvey, his, the content of his uh, email was, uh, was not disrespectful um, to Corporal Conrath or, or arguably to uh, uh, Captain Meidel either. Um, I, so there was no there was no discipline. Was it a reply all? Yes, it was. And uh, did it appear then that it was that the detective's reply was earnest and not snarky or sarcastic? I believe that uh, I, I believe that De Detective Harvey was probably not. Um, it, it's if you knew Detective Harvey, it's difficult to. Uh, to uh, get into the, the, the mind of Detective Harvey, I guess, and, and what, what it is that he was trying to express there. I, I would say that um, I think he was trying to make light of the situation, but I, I do not believe that he was, he was being disrespectful to any one individual. And he consoled Mr. Conrad based upon his email. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Thank you. What was the content of that email again? 
it, and this is from, from memory, um, it wasn't a very long email, but uh, Corporal Conrath apologizes to the department that, that, um, that they had to receive the all police email. And if I remember correctly, Detective Harvey's email said something to the effect of, um, it, it's okay, um, you, you didn't let me down. I mean, those sorts of things, it, it was pretty small and insignificant. Okay. And you have a copy of that, I assume, somewhere? I could get one, yes. Okay. Thank you, Assistant Chief Lundgren. Thank you. No, I just <clears throat> I want to remind everyone, I believe that we have concluded our testimony. I wanted to remind everyone that the commission's job here is to determine whether the department had just cause in passing over Corporal Conrad, and we are going by <clears throat> Civil Service Rule 5, Section 4A, which is no promotion certification shall be rejected except for reasonable cause, and no promotional eligible shall be passed over except for reasonable cause. Reasonable cause for passing over a promotional eligible may include the following. One, an eligible's documented substandard work performance, or two, an eligible's documented prior disciplinary problems, or three, documented errors in an eligible's judgment, or four, any other documented performance-related reasons, or five, mutual Passover. I just want to let everyone know that as the commission um, goes into discussion on this, those are the rule, that's the rule that we're under here to make our decision. Thank you. Before we adjourn, we are not gonna do any deliberations today. We will um, let everyone know shortly of a special meeting to conclude this. But before we adjourn, uh, are there any final uh, statements from the city? Mr. Bolasina, any final statements you wanted to make? Mr. Coleman, any final statements you'd like to make to the commission? Yes, but Mr. Conrad did get an opportunity to testify. I'm sorry, I didn't hear any of that. Mr. Conrad did get an opportunity to testify in this appeal. Uh, if he wanted to, I know we're under time constraints. We would come back again for a special setting to ensure that he wants to have this matter heard. Um, I apologize because this is my fault. Um, nope, let's just go ahead. We're going to first excuse Mr. Holt. He has to leave, and then we'll go ahead and take Thank the you, testimony. Commissioner. Commissioner Holt is going to watch the remaining testimony via you, electronically, and then uh, we will reconvene to discuss. Thank you so, very much for that uh, conversation. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you sir. to both counsel and to the witnesses for their uh, testimony today. Thank you, commissioners. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck on your run. <laughs> Mr. Coleman, go ahead and um, thank you. Bring, bring up your first witness. Well, I'd like to bring up Corporal Conrath. Are we, it's not, it's not good morning. Can I just say good morning? Windowless room. Good afternoon, Corporal Conrath. Before we get started, I'll swear you in real quick. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in the matter now being heard will be the truth? I do. Thank you. Corporal Conrath, can you state your full first name, spell the last? Uh, Christopher Conrath, C-O-N-R-A-T-H. And what is your current profession? I'm a police corporal for the city of Spokane. How long have you served uh, as law enforcement with the city of Spokane? I've been with the agency for 15 years. My first two years were as a reserve officer where I volunteered to work patrol. I've been uh, full-time for 13 years now. Uh, can you briefly detail to the commission the status of your, uh, we were calling them check-ins, your... Uh, is annual performance reviews? Uh, our performance reviews, we, we call them PARs. Um, well, to simplify it, uh, my performance reviews are glowing uh, with specific emphasis on judgment, decision making, and leadership. Um, Let me ask you a question. We've been talking about past disciplinary hearings, past appeals. Uh, what year were those allegations from that uh, generated? Uh, those two hearings? 2015. 
Um, and there, that's what's being talked about today is your past disciplinary history? Yes. Um, so not to belabor the point, if you could tell the commission, Corporal Conrath, um, tell them what happened. About the email. I know we're under some time constraints, so I'll, I'll keep it keep it short. I, there's been a lot of uh, inferences made to my subjective intent, so I guess who better else for you to hear it from but me. I'm the guy who authored the email. Uh, I did send that email. I do regret sending the email, and I can see how uh, there was some sarcasm and some minimization uh, written into that. Yes, I was tired. That's not really much of an excuse. I'm, I'm tired a lot. I work night shift than I have for my entire career. I'm tired often. So um, I'm pretty highly regarded uh, by the folks that I work with. Uh, I would challenge you to find any member of our department who has worked with me who would disagree with that. Um, I'm, I'm known for leadership and, and judgment and good decision making. I want to follow up with you on that. Um, so, what is an out of grade sergeant? And we can be spared 3% about pay. Um, there is a version of being an out of grade uh, rank where, like say an out of grade sergeant, uh, as uh, the major was referring to it, would mean you get your third stripe on your uniform, you, you are a full-fledged sergeant, however you're considered out of grade, and you can be, uh, I guess, bumped down from that rank, and that's my understanding. As we, as we refer to it, uh, a corporal can be um, considered an out-of-grade corporal acting, as acting sergeant, and that's the way it's labeled within our payroll program, and that's the screenshot we were referencing. So I have nearly 1,000 hours of, of having filled that position. And Does that mean you're, excuse me if I may. Oh, please go ahead. <laughs> that doesn't mean you're a full-fledged sergeant. There are some things you cannot do. You cannot administer discipline. You can't uh, do certain, uh, you don't have access to certain programs and functions that we do, like blue teams, reviews of uses of force, et cetera. But generally speaking, it means my sergeant is not there for my half of the city, and so I fill that role. Uh, yes, there, are, there will be a lieutenant on duty, someone who's a shift commander. There will be a sergeant on the opposite side of the city that I can consult uh, if I need help, if I need advice. But generally speaking, it's my job. I fill the sergeant's role, um, and I'm trusted to do that. For uh, in, in 2021, as was referenced earlier, I, there was a four to five month period where I had no sergeant for all of that time, and I ran the team all by myself, with very minimal input from from my lieutenant, and I was commended for having done a good job there. So I, I'm proud of that. That that happened. Do they have to take you as an out-of-grade sergeant just because you're a corporal? Is it mandatory that if your sergeant's gone, they have to take you? If they don't want you to be a sergeant, can administration put someone else in there? I don't think so. There's no one else to fill that role. So in the absence of a sergeant, the acting corporal does function as the out-of-grade sergeant. Is they, if they didn't want you in there, if they thought your judgment was poor, if they thought you were reckless, you were dangerous, are you telling me they still would have to take that corporal or could they put someone else in there to fill that spot? I would say that if they felt that way, I, I wouldn't have that position. Uh, I mean, a corporal is a faux supervisory role, but uh, you know, if I, if I go into work tomorrow and there's no sergeant, I am the de facto out of grade sergeant. There's not gonna be any other considerations. Those 2015 claims that keep coming up were you had an inappropriate relationship with a DV victim, and we didn't know if she was of sound mind and body because she was going to such a dark time. It's been brought up too much. Can you tell the commission how that panned out? With regard to? The discipline, uh, the withdrawal of the complaint, um, and the inducement of, the initial inducement to make the complaint. Well, I received a letter of finding where the, uh, the accusations were sustained, and it said that there were to be, due to the policy 1020.2.3 subsection D, there would be no sanctions, and that followed with a list of sanctions. 
and then immediately after that, I, my promotion was taken. So I, one could argue there were definitely sanctions. And doesn't the policy for SPD say that on those civil complaints uh, that they shall not be accepted after a year? That is my understanding of the way the policy reads, yes. And was there contact with the complainant of that uh, by SPD for her to make that complaint even though she didn't want to? I'm sorry, contact by whom? Did the complainant from that 2015 allegation uh, want to make a complaint initially? I. I I can't really speak intelligently about that. I, I know there was some back and forth about whether they wanted to go move forward with a complaint, and it, it seemed as if they were persuaded to move forward with it. Was there a crime? Was she a DV victim? Because that's what was said. She, she wasn't the victim of anything, and there certainly was no indication of a criminal act. Um, the call turned out to be more of a maintenance call where she couldn't work her sprinklers since she thought they might have been damaged. Is that correct? That's correct. Scoring a sergeant, rule one. Can you talk to the commission about how you performed? We know your performance reviews, but how you performed in the testing? Well, after the written examination, I was at the top of the list. I was number one. Uh, we then have another process where there's oral interviews, and we call it the assessment center. So it's a multifaceted interview process. And uh, after that, I still ranked. Uh, High on the list, I don't recall my exact ranking, three or four, something like that. There was a little bit of hay made about how you didn't apply. For, for the recent? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, did not, I did not test for this most recent promotional period. I didn't see the point of it because. Uh, how many times now have you been uh, denied uh, under the rule of one? Well, two different promotional lists for a total of six Passovers, quote, for cause. But uh, did you hear admins say it doesn't mean forever? Yes. And um, do you keep having this denial and this discipline used against you, even though these are already investigations that have either been unfounded? or had discipline previously on them? Well, it does seem that way. You know, seven, seven and a half years ago, I, I, made a, I made a huge mistake. And I paid a price for that, and I continue to on a daily basis. Um, we're short on time, folks. I mean. No, actually, Councillor, we're not, we're not short on time. Oh, we're good. Right, and I don't so, want the corporal to think that he's not getting his day. Thank so you. So really, I, I wouldn't worry about that. Now, I, I, I don't prefer to have dinner here tonight, but I, I think we can get it done. So you spoke to IA. Have you ever heard of the assistant chief and a major going down to IA personally with an email? Have any knowledge of that ever happening before in your 16, 15 years? Uh, well, n no, I've never heard of that. It seemed a little bit unorthodox to me. Um, are you aware of anything else where the assistant chief would go down at all to IA like that? I, I'm not. I, I, I make a habit of not trying to be privy to the matters that concern in internal affairs. And this but. is the assistant chief, and the chief is Chief Midell. And this is an allegation involving potential insubordination um, to Captain Midell. Is that correct? Correct. So this investigation, this denial for an email over a box that wasn't checked by a report you did not write. And how long did you work previously? That evening I worked uh, 15 hours. And what teams were you running? 
Well, I was the corporal for two power shift teams and two graveyard teams, which means north and south for both shifts. So you're pulling a double, but then you're pulling double duty on each. Effectively. Um, you ever seen anyone else uh, in your entire life, let's remove professional career, um, you ever seen anyone send an email too quick? Of course I have, yes. Have you seen them uh, subjected to IA investigation? I have not. Have you seen them deny promotions? No. Was this an attempt to belittle, disparage, harass, be insubordinate to Captain Mydell? And, and I think that's the part of this issue that I, or that this matter rather, that I take issue with. Um, my email was not directed towards Captain Meidel, or any administrator for that matter. It was, and when I say that it was a genuine apology, I, I mean that it was a genuine apology to my peers, to my coworkers, who had all been effectively reprimanded for a mistake, a clerical error that I made. I did, I did do that. I made, a, I made a mistake on that collision report. That was my responsibility and I own that. Uh, but well, and we know Detective Harvey thought it was a valid apology and consoled you. I haven't spoken to Detective Harvey about it, but he did reply to the email. I don't think that helped things. A detective? Correct. Um, So, was this a mistake or was this insubordination? Well, it was obviously a mistake, clearly a mistake. Uh, I wish to God I had not sent that email. Uh, the price I paid for that is, uh, is tremendous, um, but I don't think it's insubordination. I know it's not insubordination. That's why a panel of experts who reviewed all the information concluded that it was not insubordination. Does it appear to you that there's some driving force for these denials and investigations that's somewhat unknown at this time? If you feel like, if you're asking if me if I feel like I'm being targeted, then the answer to that would be yes. Thank you. Um, I have nothing further on direct, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Bolasina. I was able to view it, but I wasn't able to participate. I didn't have access to cameras and microphones, etc. Were you able to hear it? I was. All right. And do you recall hearing Cor uh, Chief Meidel saying that, you know, I'm, de he's, I'm passing him over now, but, you know, if he exercises good judgment in the future and demonstrates that he's capable of doing that, then he'll be, avail you know, considered for promotion then. Do you remember hearing him say something like that? I do. All right. And that hearing was in July of 2021, correct? I believe so. All right. And a formal decision came out from the Civil Service Commission affirming the Passover about a month later, correct? Yes, or maybe it happened that same day. Well, there was a verbal decision the same day, but the, the written decision, I think, came out a month later. Okay. All right. And then it was about a month after that written decision came out that you sent the email that is Exhibit 4, correct? Correct. All right. And, and that's the reason why we're here, isn't it? Well, we're here to appeal a Passover for cause as right. to whether or not there was cause. And, and, and Chief Meinl told you what you needed to do in order to become a sergeant, which was demonstrate good judgment over a period of time um, and then within two months after hearing that, you send the email that's Exhibit 4, correct? Correct. All right. Now let's turn to Exhibit 4, because we, we, we didn't look at this during your direct testimony. Yeah. 
You recall telling uh, Sergeant Uberagua during the IA investigation that this was a genuine, heartfelt apology, correct? Correct. Right. And that you didn't even know, you didn't even know how anyone could interpret this as a piece of snark and insolence, correct? I don't know that those were my exact words. Right. Well, isn't that, isn't that, the, sub, isn't that the gist of what you were saying? Is that I don't even know how they could be upset about this, this genuine, heartfelt apology email I sent, right? Uh, no, incorrect. Well, actually, let's take a look at it. Take a look at Exhibit 7, page 4. All right. So if you look down uh, about the third from the bottom, it says, I wanted to apologize to my coworkers for falling short and causing another email for them to have read. Uh, and it was, in fact, my mistake. Did I read that correctly? Yes. All right. Looking above that, uh, about two-thirds of the way down, it says, uh, question, what was your purpose in writing the email? Answer, to address the issue that occurred, to take responsibly, responsibility for it, and to genuinely apologize to my coworkers for rece receiving yet another all-police email. Did I read that correctly? Yes, you did. Okay, turn the page. All right, looking at, at, at the first paragraph, the last line, it says, I didn't think it would be construed as so offensive to whoever has the issue here. Did I read that correctly? Yes, you did. All right. All right. How about going down to about halfway down, uh, where it says, you see, I'm trying to find an area within the email that's problematic. Did you, did you say that? I'm sorry, I don't see where you're at. Okay, it's about halfway down. Oh. Yeah, where it says CC, and it starts out, well, since being advised of this internal and air affairs investigation about 15 minutes ago, I read the email one time since then, and, and I'm trying to find an area within the email that's problematic, right? Correct. All right. So, so um, that was your testimony to Sergeant Ubaqua and Lieutenant Coles, wasn't it? You couldn't even find an area in this email that's problematic. Do you see any today? Well, while I, while I stand by my previous statements uh, during my interview, my point there is that I, I didn't see a problem with it at the time. Today, I've acknowledged that I regret having sent it, and I can see how someone could infer tone from this written apology. However, what I did, in fact, do was apologize and take responsibility for, it, for what I did. So let's, let's look at exhibit number four. It says. Uh, the last sentence of that first paragraph you wrote, rest assured I am now sufficiently motivated to come in to work tonight and to do a better job for you. Uh, did, did you mean that? Did you mean that when you sent this email to 400 people that you were really, really now motivated to come into work and do a good job? I come into work every night motivated to do a good job. No, but did you say, this email from Captain Meidel, that's what really motivated you to come in and do a good job. Did you really mean that when you wrote that? I say yes and no. Yes, I do mean that, because uh, if I can't come to work prepared to do my very best, then I'm not going to come to work that day. Right, and how so did this email from Captain Meidel make you even more interested in coming to work to do your good job that day? Because I made a mistake and everyone else had to be reprimanded for it. So, by God, I won't make that mistake again. Hmm. Hmm. Isn't what you meant, Corporal Conrath, is, is, I work so hard here, how dare you, you petty micromanager, you know, criticize me <laughs> for making a, a clerical, not, not catching somebody else's clerical error. In fact, aren't you telling Captain Meidel, you are destroying my morale by picking on me for this silly mistake? Respectfully, you're testifying for me. Those are not my words. You can deny it. You can, you can deny and I what do. you were really saying in that sentence was, how dare you petty micromanager criticize me <clears throat> for this mistake when I'm working so hard here as a corporal? Not at all. all right. 
What about, fortunately though, I received six emails today to remind me of my repeated failure to supervise. Is that, did you mean that? That, that you felt very lucky to have received those six emails reminding you of your mistake? It was actually seven emails that I received. Oh, all right. My question is, is did, did you really feel fortunate to have received those six emails? Or were you actually saying like, like, I actually am annoyed and feel harassed by the emails that Captain Meidel's petty micromanaging occasioned? Again, those are your words, not mine. Was I, was I unhappy that, at the fact that I had received so many communications about uh, the self-insured box on a collision report, yes, I wasn't happy to wake up to that. And Wait. there are, excuse me, I, if I can answer. There is some sarcasm in the, fortunately though, I received six emails. Uh, no, no, I'm not happy that I received six emails. So, if it's what you want me to say here, that part of it is problematic. And that was the part that I rushed through and should not have said in my email. Well, what I'd like you to do, Corporal Conrath, is finally tell the truth about your motivation in sending this email on September 28th. That's what I would like you to do. I have told the truth. Did you tell the truth to Sergeant Ubaragua when you said, this email was a genuine apology, a heartfelt apology, and I don't know why anyone would take it any other way. Did you tell the truth then? Well, I told the truth in the quotes that I made, not, not the ones that you're stating, sir. Now, this email you sent, uh, did you think it was appropriate if you felt overworked to tell the entire commission police officer staff about you know, your feelings of, 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 of self-pity? Probably not. Is there, another, is there another means for you to complain if in fact you know, your beef is, I, I feel I'm being overworked or unappreciated? I'm not making any effort to complain. Now, the person that sent you the email was Captain Meidel, correct? One of the emails came from Captain Meidel. Yeah. And she was the person who actually was on the ARP pod uh, who had testified at this hearing in July of 2021, correct? <laughs> Yes. Right. Is, it her, is it her imagination that you're giving her the cold shoulder uh, when she sees you around the police department? I rarely, if ever, see Captain Meidel. I work in the night time. I don't recall ever seeing her or giving her the cold shoulder. And so is it, it is her imagination that, that you're giving her the cold shoulder? I can't speak to that. I can say that I don't feel like I'm giving her the cold shoulder. Is it also her imagination that, that this email that you sent on September 28, 2021, is disrespectful and insolent towards her and undermines her authority? This was not directed towards Captain Meidel in any way, shape, or form. It was directed towards my peers. And it's regrettable, and I wish I had not sent it, but I did. Now you're, you're familiar with the position of sergeant that you seek to, to have, don't you? Aren't you? Yes, I am. Yeah, and you do realize that sergeants are uh, role models on the patrol shifts where they served. I do realize that. Right, and you do realize that they are relied upon for exercising good judgment. Yes. Right, and 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 good judgment is is something that when when and if to send an email, that's something that people rely on their good judgment in making that decision, don't they? Yes, they do. Right. And who to send that email to, that's something that requires good judgment as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. Right. And, and this, and, and you, I mean, I've heard like, well, it's just, it's just an email. But, but, you know, if this is seen as an email that is ridiculing uh, somebody on the command staff, uh, do you see that as a, a, you know, sending an email that ridicules somebody on command staff as an exercise of bad judgment? I wouldn't say that I ridiculed anyone. If, you, if this email was ridiculing command staff, would that be an exercise of bad judgment? 
if someone were to send a ridiculing email to command staff, that would be poor judgment, yes. Right. What if uh, somebody was to send a ridiculing email about command staff to everyone in the Spokane Police Department? Would that be an exercise of bad judgment? If that were to happen, yes, that would be bad judgment. Right. And if that were to happen, do you agree that that would be the basis for passing somebody over for promotion to a leadership position that serves as a role model to others? Maybe, maybe not. What, well, what if it was after somebody had just been denied promotion or passed over for promotion for other exercises of bad judgment? Would it then be grounds for passing them over for that insolent and disrespectful email? We're just talking hypothetically here. Of course we are, yeah. Then maybe it would be. I have no more questions. Mr. Coleman, any additional comments? How good does it feel uh, to get seven emails about a mistake you made? Well, it doesn't feel very good. How embarrassing was it for you in front of your peers? Mr. Coleman, we can't hear oh, I'm you. Sorry. As, uh, first question was, how good does it feel to have uh, seven of your supervisors in one night remind you about a mistake you made? It doesn't feel good. What about in front of all your peers? Uh, that's not great either. However, I, I, I trust the, the view that my peers and subordinates have of me. It has occurred to me that we've been talking all day about what we think your email meant. Would you read it for the commissioners? I think it's 3-4. What was that? The email says, I'm afraid I owe all of you an apology. It was I who failed to recognize that, quote, self-insured was not noted on a collision report involving a vehicle owned by the sewer department. I can only imagine the difficulty this error has caused some of you to include risk management personnel. Fortunately, though, I received six emails today to remind me of my repeated failures to supervise. Rest assured, I am now sufficiently motivated to come in tonight and do a better job for you. Sometimes amidst a 15-hour shift and while working as the only corporal between four patrol teams to include power shift and graveyard, there lies the possibility that a clerical error may, may occur. I take full responsibility for this mistake, and again, I'm very sorry. Chris. Thank you. Uh, Corporal Conrad, I have nothing further on redirect. I have, a, I have a question for you. Um, you, keep, you keep talking about um, taking, the, taking the responsibility for mistakes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, and, I, and in your interview transcript at page six, you said, you know, if, if everybody you work with takes heat for your mistake, you don't like that. You, you talked about that a lot, correct? Yes. Um, and you don't want people to suffer, suffer for your errors. I think you also testified. Absolutely not. Okay. And, I, and, I, and if I understand the logic, the logic here is that captain, the captain's email was somehow a reprimand. You've used that word a few times today as well. Is, is, so in your opinion, the captain's email was a reprimand to all of your peers. Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, yes, that's the, that's the context with which I use that word. The email so talks about any city of Spokane vehicle involved in a collision should note self-insured and not include the actual insurance company on the Washington State Collision Report form. Is that a reprimand or no, instructive? That, that, it's, it's instructive. Okay. In addition, to minimize confusion, you can discard the insurance card in your city-owned vehicle per risk management. Is that a reprimand? No, ma'am. I've been addressing these errors as they come in, but our claims adjuster is understandably frustrated when the errors occur and the supervisors aren't catching them upon their review either. Is that a reprimand? No. And then that's the end of the email, correct? I believe so, yes. I can tell you actually it ends with thank you, Tracy. That's how it ends. So. That was the only email that went out to all of your peers, correct? Yes. 
all the, the, the couple other emails were just between you and your supervisors. That's correct. And it really wasn't until you sent the reply all where you changed the subject to I'm sorry that your peers had any idea that perhaps your review of police reports the night before was even in topic, correct? Quite possibly, yes. So none of, none of them even knew they were taking any heat for you until you suggested in your email that maybe they were, correct? I, I, perhaps what I mean when I say that is that when uh, we, rec we receive a, an email about a problem that's occurring, we all have to ask ourselves, was that me that made that mistake? Mm -hmm. Well, no, it was me. So you all can quit worrying about whether you had been uh, creating this problem. It was me. And uh, no, in, in the grand scheme of reprimands, this is not much of a reprimand, okay? But we're all being counseled on, on a, a problem that's occurring. And it's really not occurring as widespread as, as it sounds. It, I made a mistake. It was me. And this is something that I know about. Approving collision reports and other reports is one of my core functions. And I messed it up. So I'm, I'm a little bit dissatisfied with the fact that I made the mistake. And I'm also dissatisfied with the fact that everyone else had to, had to hear about it yet again because of what I did. So when I say reprimand, I guess that's what I mean. And uh, when I say I don't like my, my peers to take heat for my mistakes, that's what I mean by that. I don't want them to have to hear about my errors. So the emails that you received prior to the all commissioned officers email did suggest that you missed something. Let me know when you're done, Counselor. Yes. I'm sorry. You received some emails that late morning advising you to correct the box where you have to identify insurance coverage, correct? Yes. Then the all commission email came out. Yes. Then you hit reply all and wrote your email, right? Yes, I did. How do you know you were the only corporal or only person reviewing or writing police reports that made that same mistake? I don't know that. Right, okay. You've repeatedly said, I regret sending that email today. Why? Well, a number of reasons. Um, it, it, reflect, it reflects poorly on me. It's drawn, brought a lot of attention to, to me, um, negative attention. Um, and when I say that I'm highly regarded amongst my peers. I mean that. And so for them to become aware that, yeah, I did this, and now I'm losing a promotion because of it, uh, those people are, many of them, looking forward to the time when I promote. Uh, so I'm not. And that's disappointing for me and for, for, some, for many of them as well. So there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons why I regret having sent it. Um, that's not characteristic of me. It was. What, what's was not hasty. characteristic of you? Uh, to, to, to speak without thinking about what I'm trying to say, to send an email without putting proper thought into it, to type something out and send it without proofreading it. Um, would you agree then that's poor judgment? I would. You would? Okay. Thank you. I, I will not dispute that this was poor judgment. It was. And the previous uh, disciplinary actions revolving around the 2021 hearing, was that poor judgment as well? Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. That's all I have. Well, I'd like to correct the record. That's a 2015 matter that was only heard in 2021. So when we read the email in whole from Captain Mydell, where it begins, all, once again, I'm sending out a reminder. Do you find that 
How would you classify that statement? Is that a reprimand? Make you feel good? Uh, I have used the term reprimand. Uh, in the grand scale of reprimands, it's a weak reprimand. But I think, yes, we're being counseled on having not done, done the job correctly. Is the captain happy by sending this email out? I don't think so. Moving forward, are you not getting the promotion because of poor judgment or because of email uh, to all people in insubordination? Because I'm having a hard time keeping the issues correct. Why are we here? I'm here to dispute whether this email in itself is caused to well, for insubordination uh, and to pull a promotion from me. And that's what we're here on. Um, should this be some grand indictment on your character? I don't think so. I have nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Commissioners, other questions? May I? Uh, Corporal Conroth, um, does, the, <clears throat> does the department or the city, uh, to your knowledge, provide any type of training for individuals in one position seeking to advance their position? For instance, um, does the department, for instance, provide training or directional classes or something like that that someone can take who wants to, besides getting on the promotional list from from sergeant to, or from corporal to sergeant, um, are there classes provided to you and others? I would say that there's not classes necessarily specifically designed for that purpose. However, uh, as a, I keep saying, use the term faux, faux supervisor, I'm allowed to participate in supervisor training uh, for sergeants, which is monthly. Um, there are, I've, I've participated in a sergeant's academy. When you're on the promotional list and you're soon to be a sergeant, uh, sometimes if, if the time schedule works out, you can go, and it's, I believe it's a three day. So there is at least some, uh, and do sure. you think, have you ever gone to those classes or made yes, time? Yes, I've, I've participated in a sergeant's academy and I've been to some of the you supervisor have? trainings. Do they, um, um, to be honest with you, it, it you know, you, you talked about that you have a glowing PAR. Yes, ma'am. Congratulations. Um, but your, um, I would, I would think that you would probably admit that your choice of judgment sometimes isn't the best. And uh, you're saying now that you're really sorry you wrote this email, or at least in the way that it was construed, whether you meant it that way when you originally wrote it or not. That's how it sounded to other people. So um, I'm just wondering if there are um, opportunities afforded to you that would help you in your, your, your judgment cases um, so that um, as you want to move up in the department, that might come a little easier to you. I hear what you're saying, and I and I don't believe there such a thing does exist. Um, but I think a big part of my point is that yes, I made a mistake here, and we've been just hyper focused on this one matter. And I, I did send an email like this, right? But I'm also working every single night, making literal life and death decisions, and making the right ones, time and time again, hundreds of times every night, and. I do very well at that. So you, you do that every night. So anyone looking to promote you should ignore this email and your lack of judgment a few years ago. Would you say that? I wouldn't say that. I guess what I would like to see is that the, uh, the repercussions are, are proportional to the offense. Thank you. Mr. Stevens. Just a quick question for you. Yes, sir. From 28 September 2021 to today's date, 
How many PARs have you had? One, and I should have one coming out shortly. Okay. Are you doing them, uh, are they being done semi-annually or annually these days? Annually. Okay. And of those PARs you've had or just the informal reviews of your performance, have any performance deficiencies been brought to your attention in that time frame from 28 September on? I don't believe any performance deficiencies have been documented. That's the only question I had. I think we can conclude this item and we can adjourn the meeting if you want to. Okay. I, I believe we, we've asked all our questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Um, Any closing statements? Mr. Bolasina, any final oh, statements that you'd like to make? Please come, please come on up. So one, one of the things I wanted to raise is that the, sort of the difference between Oh, sorry, thank you. The difference between making a disciplinary decision and a promotional decision, because they're very, very different processes. Uh, and you, as a Civil Service Commission, can be involved in both. But when you're making a disciplinary decision, you are, you are asking, you know, is there just cause to take something away from a person? And when you're making a promotional decision, you're asking, you know, is there a cause to actually elevate this person? in the workplace. And I think it's, it's, it's logical and reasonable to apply different standards to both of those decisions. And the decision here is, is, is should uh, Corporal Conrath been elevated to the position of sergeant? And, and there are a couple reasons uh, why the answer is properly no. And, and the first one is it, it does go back to the prior Civil Service Commission hearing and, and the fact that the Civil Service Commission decided as a, as a group that, that it was reasonable to pass him over uh, based on these prior, you know, uh, errors in his judgment or lapses of his, in his judgment. And that was, you know, having romantic uh, affairs with women he met while responding to DV calls. And, and the, the, the problem with that behavior is that while it might be instantly gratifying to have a romantic relationship with somebody you've met and who's impressed with that you're a police officer, it's not in the interest of the woman herself, and both these women were, were married at the time and in very vulnerable states. Uh, it's not in the interest of the department to, to embark on a relationship like this, and it's not in the interest of law enforcement generally. And, and this was a problem for Chief Meidel when Corporal Conrath came up for sergeant that he had be engaged in this behavior. And, and one of them had been back in 2015. The other had been in around the same time period, but the department had just learned about it through a complaint from this woman's husband just prior to the promotional decision being made. Uh, and as I mentioned, Chief Meidel said, you know, at that hearing that, that you know, Corporal Conrath is technically a good officer, um, but, you know, there are these errors in his judgment that have come to him uh, in the past and recently, and he didn't think that based on what had just happened, um, what he just learned of, that enough time has passed for Corporal Conrath to be elevated to the position of sergeant. Mm -hmm. And then within a couple months after that happening, uh, Corporal Conrath sends this email. And, and frankly, I might, I might be more of an authoritarian than everyone else in the room here. <laughs> but if somebody sent an email, uh, you know, if I sent that reminder email that Captain Meidel sent and then gave the helpful suggestion about this is what you can do in the future to keep this problem from happening again, and then if one of my employees sent that email to everyone I work with, uh, it wouldn't be should you get a promotion, it should be, would be should you be employed here tomorrow? <laughs> but that's, I'm more of an authoritarian than, than a lot of people, so I just think that, that you, know, you need to show deference and respect 
um, in a law firm, even more so in a police department that has a hierarchical, hierarchical organization, a military-like organization, where people need to basically follow the direction and show respect for the direction of their commanding officers. Um, I think that this, this email that you've seen, um, when Corporal Conrath wrote it, uh, he may have been tired from working a long shift the night before, uh, but he knew exactly what he was doing. The language that he uses, the tone that he uses, he is basically poking at Captain Meidel and saying these things. I work very hard here. This was a tiny little error, and how dare you, how dare you hold me or anyone else accountable for it? And he is basically taking aim at her uh, you know, her, her direction uh, at the fact that she is doing her job by making sure that these errors don't occur in the future, uh, taking aim at her suggestion for keeping these errors. Uh, and this went to everyone in the department. And I, and I submit to you, I mean, you heard from Captain Meidel and Chief Lundgren and Major Olson, and when they saw this email, they saw it for exactly what it was. And it was insolent and disrespectful. And I submit to you that there is no one who saw this email and read it at the time it was received that came to any other conclusion than that. And so, yes, it is an email, but this is what that email says about Corporal Conrath, that he doesn't stop to think before he acts. He does not stop to act ask what is you know, the impact on the department? What is the impact on law enforcement generally? What is this the, the impact on the people that I work with if I, take, if I engage in this behavior? Uh, he's not showing the level of judgment and leadership and discretion that the department is looking for in deciding who to make a sergeant. It just isn't there yet. It may never be there, but it's, not, it's certainly not there yet. And the fact that this occurred just a couple months after you know, the department gave him a very strong signal, this is what we expect of you if you're going to advance, and then he does this, that just shows that you know, we're not changing, we're not growing, we are doing the same things that got us passed over for promotion before. And, and the fact is that, that, and again, he sent this to everyone in the department. And everyone saw him basically, you know, taking shots at, at his commanding captain. To promote him after he did that is really to send the message that, you know, this kind of behavior in this department is tolerated. And you can't run an effective a police department if, in fact, this kind of behavior is tolerated. So, so even though it was just dealt with as a reprimand, um, the fact that it is now impacting his ability to promote shortly after it occurred, basically, I think, is consistent with the serious level of, of transgression that was involved here. So uh, the city asks you when, you, when you deliberate in a couple days, to, to affirm its decision to pass over Corporal Conrath for promotion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bolasina. Mr. Coleman, did you have any final comments? Yeah, sorry I was late today. Got help in court. Um, this argument that sending a snap email is an indictment on his judgment is a joke. Anyone who's forwarded it is forwarding a joke. It is the most hypocritical and duplicitous statement I think I've ever heard uttered out loud. There's not one person in this gallery sitting in those seats or sitting in these that hasn't made a similar mistake. I made more than most. Six times. Highest qualified. Rule of one. If you get it, you get it. Six times. But it's not forever. Oh, and it's not disciplinary. These are jokes. Okay. Yeah, sorry he didn't apply. Sorry he didn't go for the seventh time. Really. Sorry he didn't he apply for the seventh time. Um, because it's working. The assistant chief and a major go to IA over an email, and yeah, I'll submit that it does bring someone in. A detective who consoles him. Trained observer. 
Mass email. Consoling Mr. Conrad. But that's inconvenient, so we're not going to look at that. As long as this commission allows this department to continue to lose these already past dealt with allegations, past dealt with things, to deny this man's promotion, they will continue. No other way to say it. It'll, it'll happen. Um, no other way to stop it. This is supposed to be the stop on that. This is supposed to be the stop on denying people promotions or affecting them with discipline for things they can't do because they're against policy or shouldn't do because they're based on something besides work or thinly veiled personal grudges or grinds. Um, six times. Number one. Uh, you know, I used to work for the state. Everything would get charged if it came on my desk. Everything would get charged up. And my supervisor one day grabbed me, and he said, things can happen that aren't crimes. Accidents can happen. Mistakes can happen. Um, I welcome anyone in this gallery, sitting in judgment, up here with us, to really swap spots and to check in with themselves, with their conscience, with their integrity. Um, some sort of moral indictment that he shows bad judgment by sending an email when he's out there. It's almost offensive to what he does, and we put it on the line that we would even come to that. But that's why we're here. So six times, number one candidate. Um, if he doesn't wash his hands the right way, he's going to draw another action administratively. Um, he's already kind of beaten down. He didn't test last time. This appeal is pending. He's here. And they're working him. They don't want to say it, but they're working him. When the sergeant's gone, that's your sergeant. They got no problem letting him take care of the north and the south. Watch over those men leading them. Unless it comes time to give him a stripe on his arm. Um, and if you're annoyed with me for being late, I get it. I'm annoyed with myself, too. District courts are not taking that long, but we're running out of good cops left and right. I work for their unions. There's good cops and bad cops. We don't need to be running the good ones out when there's so few and far between. These men can be shot, stabbed, killed, prosecutors sued. Retirement is the least likely outcome. And a snap email, even if it is crummy, to say it's insubordination, an indictment on his good judgment when he's protecting all of us in our city is slightly offensive to me, um, but at all not logical and not appropriate. Appreciate your time. Um, give this man his promotion. He's putting his time. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Thank you. We still have a, a couple of items left on our agenda. No, we're not going to do those at all. We're going to call this meeting adjourned. Uh, before I do that officially, though, uh, should let everyone know that's interested the commissioners will reconvene once we've had an opportunity to talk to each other and figure out what each other's schedules are so that we can discuss and make a decision on everything we've heard today and on the packet that was sent to us that we read before today. So um, uh, we will probably convene in executive session but when we make a decision, it has to be public. So we will hold at least a brief meeting to, um, to render that decision. Um, you can stay in touch with the chief examiner on when those dates are. Um, the commission is a volunteer commission and therefore um, most everybody on here works. So uh, that's where our one commissioner took off today. Um, we have one commissioner that was absent today who will 
uh, probably watched this also, who's also in court today. Uh, so we'll, we'll try and gather everybody together after they've got as much of the information as they can electronically. Um, I doubt that our, our sitting chair will probably not take part in the voting or the discussion, but the rest of us will. So you can stay in touch with the chief examiner on that date and time. I'll be reaching out to both sides, both parties, uh, shortly with information. In light of that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you for your time, everyone. Thanks.